so we'll come back to the our uh, sum up uh, school program. And uh, today, uh, Professor uh, Yusuke Matsuda of Kwansei Gaku University will give you a lecture on the uh, photosynthesis in marine science. Okay, so uh, Masa Sensei, please. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Yusuke Matsuda, and I'm going to talk about uh, photosynthesis in marine science today. Uh, uh, at first, let me introduce myself. Um, I was actually born in really east north part of Japan, which is called Kushiro, and uh, this uh, city is uh, famous for the uh, fishery and uh, oceanographic oceanographic peoples. Uh, as uh, the harbor of the uh, research line called A line, and then I went to the uh, University of. Uh, Hokkaido, uh, which is located in Sapporo. So I, I just uh, born and grew up in a really, really cold place. Then after that, I um, after I got the PhD in Hokkaido University, I just uh, moved to um, uh, Canada, which is another cold place uh, for four years and studied up. Then that's why I studied about uh, start studying about. Uh, uh, photosynthesis in uh, microscopic uh, algae in uh, York University in Toronto. Then <clears throat> I came back to Japan, which is Kansai Gakuin University. I studied Kansai Gakuin University in 1997, which is quite a, quite a long ago, actually. And this is my first time living in a hot place in Japan. And this summer is also another deadly hot, but it's not as hot as uh, Bali, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Bali's heat was actually uh, amazing to me. Um, anyway, uh, this is me, and uh, now I work in uh, Kansai Gakuin University, uh, Kobe Sanda campus. Now, today I would like to... Yeah. Today I would like to talk about these five topics. That is, first, what is photosynthesis? And second one is, what are plants in the wide meaning? So plants is a sort of uh, uh, organisms uh, which has the root and the leaves and the stems. But plants in water is not like that. They can photosynthesize, but their uh, appearance is completely different from the uh, land plants. So I want to uh, explain about uh, plants in water also. And then uh, I want to move on to the, the uh, topic, what is diatom? That is the organisms, quite important organisms, which uh, plays a major role to absorb CO2 in the global ocean. And this is the main topic of my research. And uh, as a fourth topic, uh, I want to talk about uh, diatom photosynthesis and uh, CO2 concentrating mechanism in diatom. And uh, for the last topic, I would like to introduce some uh, intriguing, intriguing uh, applied science uh, about uh, diatoms. <clears throat> okay, uh, I, I just... Uh, uh, talk along with uh, these five topics for a couple of hours. And then I will uh, uh, give you a um, uh, topics for research uh, after my talk. Then, OK, yeah. Oops. Okay, first topic is what is photosynthesis? Photosynthesis, everyone know, knows it, right? But uh, but many uh, people knows the detail of photosynthesis. So I want to talk about uh, details of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is something like, uh, like that in, in a chemical formula. Carbon dioxide uh, is... Uh, 
bind with carbon dioxide, get the electron from uh, the, the reducing a the agent, then uh, light uh, will promote this reaction and then makes the uh, organics uh, with uh, waste, which is the uh, oxidized uh, reducing reagent with uh, uh, water. So in this case, carbon dioxide uh, plays a role as an electron acceptor. And then this H2A means electron donor, which is a reductant. And then a uh, CH2O means carbohydrate. And then there is two types of photosynthesis on this on the earth. One is oxygen evolving photosynthesis. The other is photosynthesis, which does not uh, evolve oxygen. So oxygen evolving photosynthesis in a, in a oxygen evolving photosynthesis, uh, this electron donor is water. Then CO2 and water with light makes the uh, carbohydrate and produces oxygen and water. In this case, this reaction uh, requires uh, to fix one mole of CO2, uh, 686 kilocalorie. This energy comes from light. And this kind of oxygen above in photosynthesis is done by sun bacteria and eukaryotic algae and, and higher plants, which is the under plants, uh, under plants. And the other photosynthesis, which is quite minor fraction of the uh, global photosynthesis, so there is uh, such kind of photosynthesis mainly played by the, uh, mainly uh, done by bacteria, uh, which is called photosynthetic bacteria. In, in this case, uh, electron donor uh, is not water. For instance, it's a hydrogen sulfide uh, would uh, give the uh, um, electron to CO2, makes the uh, carbohydrate and emitting the uh, sulfur and uh, water. Because uh, this non uh, option evolving photosynthesis is a uh, quite minor uh, photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis way. Uh, I hereafter I only talk about the uh, oxygen evolving photosynthesis. This one. Uh, so, summing up, photosynthesis is a process to reduce CO two uh, by synthesizing organic compounds by using electron donor such as water and hydrogen sulfide, and then by converting light energy into chemical energy. Besides uh, CO two. Uh, reduction and fixation of any carbon and inorganic sulfur are also considered to be photosynthesis. Yeah, that means that uh, photosynthesis is not only means the uh, CO2 fixation, but some fraction of energy, which is about 10% of the uh, for the CO2, uh, goes to nitrogen fixation, and also 1% of the uh, light energy would go to um, uh, sulfur fixation. So that is a, a you know in total called photosynthesis. Okay, I'm gonna get into deeper part of the photosynthesis from now on. Um, at first, uh, the guy Robert Hill, uh, discovered the uh, uh one very important reaction in 1973, which is quite a, quite a long ago. Um. He what he discovered is quite interesting. Uh, that uh, he just discovered that um, with uh, appropriate a oxidizing reagent, uh, oxygen evolution can happen without uh, providing carbon dioxide. That means that uh, light reaction, which produces oxygen, in the oxygen. Uh, evolving photosynthesis does not necessarily require CO2 for that reaction, but for that reaction part of the oxygen evolution. So that 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 uh, reaction was called Hill reaction in uh, and 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 um okay that now uh we can uh measure the Hill uh, reaction 
nowadays with the uh, mass spectrometry uh, method. Okay, here the action is uh, summarized like uh, in in this uh, formula. Uh, water can be oxidized with any some appropriate uh, oxidizing reagent into uh, oxygen and proton by light energy. So if we give the um, uh, what normal water with heavy uh, CO two, then uh, by Hill reaction, uh, only normal oxygen comes from the uh, photosynthesis. But if we give the uh, uh, heavy a uh, water uh, and normal CO two, then oxygen evolved from the photosynthesis is heavy oxygen. That means that uh, this oxygen in the coming out from the um, coming out from the um, photosynthesis it came from water. That is a heat reaction. And then Daniel Arnon in 1950 uh, discovered that uh, oxygen evolving reaction and CO2 fixing reaction is completely separated. And these two reaction is called uh, photosystem reaction, photo reactions and uh, carbon reactions, Not like that. And these two reactions was uh, linked by ATP and NADPH produced in uh, light reactions. Then this ATP and NADPH is used in the carbon reactions and ATP, by, by uh, consuming ATP and NADPH, these uh, molecules is converted into ADP and NADP, NADP plus, and then it returned to the light reactions and, and light energy, again, uh, makes ATP and NADPH. Uh, so Daniel Arnon found that uh, reactions. Now, um, uh, this, you know, carbon reaction uh, was dark reaction, I was called the dark reactions uh, previously, but uh, this dark, dark reaction is not really uh, active, activated in the dark. So it is now uh, called more uh, precisely that photochemical and uh, or this reaction and uh, this, this reaction is respectively called photochemical reaction and carbon reduction reactions. <clears throat> okay, so there, by the finding of, the, of Daniel Arnum, um, it is uh, clear that photosynthesis is, in, is divided into two reactions. And these two reactions, where it happens? This is a chloroplast of the land plants. And land plant chloroplasts have uh, outer and inner two membranes. And within the uh, uh, chloroplast, there is a solution part called stroma. And there is a third uh, membrane bodies within this stroma, which is called thyracoid uh, membrane. This thyracoid membrane, by observing the uh, electron microgram, micro, uh, electron, electron microscope, is something like that. And if we close up this, you know, part, we can see the very uh, many stacks of the uh, thyracoid membranes within the stroma. That is a place that photo reaction, uh, light reactions, taken place, and. Um, you know, this uh, stacking thyracoid membrane has the uh, uh, numerous, very big uh, protein compounds uh, on, on it. That is a system which convert the uh, light energy into the chemical energies. Then this uh, chemical energies, which is ATP and NADPH produced by these a thyracoid membrane protein complexes is released to the stroma part, stroma part. And in, in stroma, uh, there is a carbon cycle reactions and that that reaction fix uh, carbon dioxide into the carbohydrate. The carbon cycle is the other name of the 
carbon reducing cycle, carbon reducing reaction. Okay, I want to talk about from the for, for, uh, talk about the photosystem from the absorption of light and conversion of energy. Okay, what is light? Light is a wave composed of vibrating electric, electric field and a magnetic field, and these two fields closes in an angle of ninety degree. And light has also um, particle characteristics. So, so light is both a wave and a particle, which is termed as a quantum. So the unit uh, component of light is called quantum. And quant quanta have their dispersed means each has own energy, which is described by the following formula. So energy equal ha nu. Ha is a, com a Planck constant, which has a value 6.6 to 6 times 10 to minus 34 joule second. And uh, nu is a vibration. That is a, a unit that has a unit of health or uh, second inverse. And then, if we uh, convert this reaction by this equation, this is the uh, light speed. C is a light speed, which is three times 10 to eight meter per second. And lambda nu, lambda is a wavelength of the light. For instance, a light of the wavelength 400 nanometer colored blue, blue color, which is a quite high energy light. And then if we uh, change the uh, new value into lambda, lambda uh, C par lambda, then we, we can uh, calculate the energy of the light uh, by the function of the lambda. Lambda is a light wavelength, okay. You sometimes can see the uh, rainbow, right? The rainbow has uh, different colors. Uh, that is a component of the uh, visible light, this, this color is. Then uh, that means, you know, the uh, sunlight is composed of blue color in, uh, towards uh, red colors, right? Which color is uh, more more energetic? Uh, we can understand from this uh, equation. Okay, if lambda is shorter, smaller, because C is a uh, light energy, and this is the constant constant value of the uh, three times ten to eight meter per second. So, and and the Planck test, Planck uh, constant is also a stable uh, value. So, this C and H is a uh, it does not change only change uh only changing value is this lambda okay if if this lambda is small value then energy gonna be higher and this lambda value is become bigger then energy gonna become smaller right this is a very simple uh mathematics then uh, as i said a, a, a few a minute a minute ago uh, blue light, for instance, uh, the wavelength of blue light is uh, something about 400 nanometer. And then the red light wavelength is something close to 800 nanometer. So which light is more, has more energy? We can calculate, you know, the blue light is this 400 nanometer, means uh, 400 times 10 to minus, uh, 10 to minus nine, meter right so uh blue light has more energy than red light because it vibrate really uh fast the blue and uh, blue light is vibrate really fast if we you know expand this vibration but but as a function of time then it's it it's wave become like that 
So it means they have a shorter wavelengths. But the red light vibrates really slowly. So if we uh, expand the, the this vibration by time, then th this wave become really gentle wave. So which means the longer wave. So faster vibration has higher energy and shorter wavelengths and longer uh, uh, and slower vibration has a longer wavelength and uh, smaller energy. Okay, sunlight is like as a quantum lane with a spectrum of vibration, means wavelengths. And our eye is only sensitive for the only limited vibration, which is called visible light. Uh, light, when it hits substance, will permeate or reflect or be absorbed. So substances which absorbs, absorb the specific visible light, visible light wavelength is 380 to 780 nanometer, is termed as a pigment. So if we if we use where for instance some, something colored red, that close of lead, that close of lead color absorbs uh its opposite side color, which is green. Then you can see the uh land plants as green, right? The land plants absorbs lead color, which is why it uh, reflect or permeate the uh, uh, green color uh, lights. Okay, uh, then after the material absorbs the light, what happens to the absorbed light quantum? So absorbed light will disappear actually, but they do not disappear for nothing. They just uh, disappear by transferring energy to the absorbent. So absorbent gets energy from the absorbed light. So photochemical reaction is a form uh, is a formation of reductant with light. Okay, so pigment can absorb specific light wavelengths, right? Then that absorbed light energy is transferred to pigment. Then pigment gonna be excited. So for uh, formed excited pigments, pigments excite star, right? Passes electron to adjacent electron acceptor, uh, initiating redox cascade reaction. So pigment, and if there is pigment and acceptor in a really close uh, place, then once pigment excited, then this uh, acceptor can get the uh, outermost electron of this pigment uh, to uh, by themselves, right? Then electron transfer happens. Then this pigment is oxidized, and this oxidized reagent gonna be reduced. Then you, you know. Here, the reaction is converted into the redox reaction. <clears throat> that is a very basic uh, system of the conversion of uh, light energy into the chemical redox energy. <clears throat> so what is a pigment in photosynthetic organism? Most important pigment is chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll uh, is a green pigment and uh, called tetrapyrrole molecule. Tetrapyrrole means four pyrrole sites. One pyrrole is structured like this, pentagonal uh, structure with nitrogen in it. And this is, there is one, two, three, four pyrroles, right? The, which is why it is called tetrapyrrole. And this tetrapyrrole ring uh, chelate magnesium at the central part. That is called porphyrin structure. Actually, human being also has a porphyrin structure. Do you know why, what it is? 
Um, you know, what is the caterpillar structure, very, very famous caterpillar structure in your body? Um, can I point some student? Uh, I cannot read the name actually. <laughs> Fi Filippo, Justin Filippo. Yeah, just Justin. Justin. Yes, sir. So, do you know uh, what is the polyphenol structure within your body? Very famous. I'm sorry, but your voice is not clear in my laptop. Uh, Can you repeat the question? What is your polyphenol? What is the polyphenol structure in your body? Hopefully, structure is something like that. But in your body, it doesn't have magnesium. Instead, it has an iron at the central part of this peripheral ring in your body. Do you know what it is? Uh, maybe a liver or skin. Ah, OK. This is uh, blood. There is a uh, hemoglobin, right, in the blood. The hemoglobin, the hem, and the hemoglobin, uh, structures like that. But instead of magnesium, it has a, a iron in it. So we also have a tetrapyrrole structure actually. And then um, chlorophyll A has a magnesium, and a uh, land plants also has a chlorophyll B, which only changes this part oxidized. And also in the marine environment, there's a very cool, in marine environment, like diatoms, uh, you know, many organisms doesn't have a chlorophyll B. Instead of chlorophyll B, they have a chlorophyll C1 and C2 and C3, which uh, changes this structure from uh, chlorophyll A, like that. And also there's some uh, cyanobacteria which has a chlorophyll D as the most important uh, chlorophyll uh, structure uh, for the photosynthesis, but most of the uh, you know uh, photosynthetic organisms, the reaction center of the photosystem is chlorophyll A, and uh, all other uh, pigment like chlorophyll B and chlorophyll C1 and chlorophyll C2 and chlorophyll C3 uh, play, uh, plays a role as a light harvesting uh, pigment, and this R is called phyto. This is a uh, derivative of the carotenoid uh, compound. And with this profane and uh, phyto tail, uh, this is called chlorophyll A. And chlorophyll C doesn't have this phyto structure in it. And, and th there are uh, subtypes of A and F, but only I only show the uh, and to D, T to, to D, uh, from A to D. Um, Electron excited by the absorption of light is uh, the pi electrons of this porphyrin ring. This porphyrin ring has a pi electron on and 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 uh, you know this at uh, this uh, double bond place. This double bonding place has rich in the uh, electrons, and this er uh, er electron is is counted twenty four. The one of twenty four pi electrons. Uh, if it hit the uh, hit by the um, uh, light quantum, then this pi electron, one of pi electron, goes to the uh, upper uh, uh, electric electric orbitals, which makes the uh, excited chlorophyll, which is basically a reductant and initiate this uh, reaction. Okay. What kind of uh, absorption of all these uh, uh, chlorophylls has is something like that. This is the uh, light energy just come from the uh, sun. So the at the outer terrestrial, the, the sun energy is ranged from 200 nanometer, which is really high energy. 
into uh, 2,500 nanometer, which is really low energy. Very big, uh, very wide spectrum of light comes to the uh, uh, comes to the Earth. But when it passes through the uh, atmosphere, then this light energy reduces something like that. And only this part from 380 to 780 is a visible light. And within this visible light, chlorophyll A, for instance, uh, absorbs around 430 nanometer light and also 665 nanometer light. But by changing very slightly this part, Coffee B absorbs quite different wavelengths like that. This this one. The shorter wavelengths exceeded 450, but uh, longer light wavelengths absorbed by chlorophyll B is a little bit shorter than that of chlorophyll A, which is about 650. And chlorophyll C is something like that in the middle, and the shorter wavelengths are the longer one. And chlorophyll D uh is uh this one is this very uh long shifted at the uh, 700 nanometer a bacterial chlorophyll a which is the uh, chlorophyll that bacteria uses which is changed uh, uh chemical structure at, at this side and this side and this side has a very uh, different uh, absorption spectra, which is shifted shifted to really short wavelengths and also shifted to very long wavelengths. In this way, uh, plants can uh, absorb quite different uh, type of the uh, light energy uh, from the sun. So chlorophyll absorbs blue and red light. Thus, plants disperse green light. So this, this part is not really well absorbed. So, which is why uh, plants, this, uh, plants looks like green. Photosynthetic organisms possesses uh, accessory pigments such as carotenoid and phycobilins for efficient absorption, absorption of sunlight. Yeah, there are different type of the uh, um, also uh, pigments that uh, absorb the uh, light energy that is not really absorbed by chlorophylls. All photosynthetic organisms possess chlorophyll A and carotenoid. So the reaction center of the light reaction is a chlorophyll A. So this formula that I showed before can be converted into this formula in plants, in photosynthetic plants. Chlorophyll A is excited by light. Hanu is a light energy. Chlorophyll A is excited by light. And there is a oxidizing uh, compound very close to chlorophyll A. Then the one of the 24 pi electron of chlorophyll A is moved to this uh, oxidizing compound and chlorophyll A gonna be uh, oxidized and this oxidizing reagent gonna be reduced. In this way, uh, for the system changes light energy into chemical redox energy. <clears throat> then uh, I want to explain about the light harvesting reaction. Uh, excitation happens in the chlorophyll A at the reaction center of the uh, photosystem, but there's a number of uh, other pigments close to this reaction center. That is called accessory pigment. This is reaction center and this is accessory pigment. What this accessory pigment does is quite interesting. 
um, axis pigment works like an antenna and transfer harvested light towards chlorophyll A at the reaction center. This process is really purely phys physical reaction. Um, a part of harvested light energy is converted into redox reaction, which is a movement of electron that is happened in this area. And reaction center chlorophyll A will lose electron. That, that, that's what I already showed. But then uh, chlorophyll A oxidized, which is a quite uh, dangerous compound, oxidized chlorophyll A. So it is instantaneously returned to the normal chlorophyll A by electron, which is come from the water. The water is oxidized here, and the electron goes to the oxidized chlorophyll A. The oxid uh, oxidized chlorophyll A reduced to a normal basic chlorophyll A, and this chlorophyll A catches energy uh, from the uh, accessory pigment, and then here reaction occurs. Uh, that is the uh, conversion of the re light reaction into the uh, uh, redox chemical reaction. That is called Hill reaction. And electron transfer will occur in this area. But in the accessory pigment, only energy transfer occurs. That is called Felster resonant energy transfer system. Uh, if the uh, uh, accessory pigment excited by light here, the energy just uh, moves without having a movement of electron. That is called uh, first resonant electron uh, energy transfer, uh, which is abbreviated into a uh, thread. The light, light excites one access pigment and energy transfer to the next one and next one, next one. This cascade reaction of energy transfer eventually goes to the reaction center and activate the chlorophyll A uh, into the, uh, you know, uh, excited chlorophyll A. <clears throat> that is happens in the uh, reaction center of the photosystem. That is uh, uh, here at the surface, uh, at, at the you know, cytochord membrane in the chloroplast. Okay, after uh, after this movement of electron initiated, what will happen, happen after that? Okay, Robert Hill and Berk, Derek Bender clarify the importance of, of redox reaction in the photosystem triggered by light. This model describes the uh, mechanism how a massive oxidant to oxidize water and a massive reductant to reduce uh, NADP plus can be synthesized in the photosynthesis. Um, they plotted the uh, electron transporting compounds in the photosystem depending upon their uh, redox potential. If redox minus redox potential is higher, then it means that it is more reductive. If the plus uh, redox potential is higher, then it means that it is more and more uh, oxidizable, oxidizing uh, compound. Then uh, Bendar and uh, Robert Hill uh, just put the uh, old compounds existing in the photosystem uh, in this uh, y at this y axis. For instance, oxygen have a one plus 1.2 uh, uh, 1 volts of the um, uh, redox potential, which is quite oxidizing. Then uh, P680 is uh, uh, chlorophyll A in the photosystem too. P680 without having the uh, light energy uh, is quite oxidizing uh, state of the uh, chlorophyll. But uh, if this chlorophyll uh, lose the uh, one electron, then P680 plus, which is the oxidized chlorophyll A, become much more strong uh, oxidant, which is quite dangerous level of the uh, oxidizing redox potential. Then this water uh, breakdown instantaneously return this oxidized chlorophyll A into 
normal crow field A of P680. And this P680 get the light energy and excited to uh, excited form of the crow field A. P680 plus uh, 80 star. This is a reductant actually, uh, which is going to be minus 0 0.8 uh, volts of the uh, redox potential. And then uh, electron transfer is initiated here. And the electron goes to a compound called ferrofighting. And electron I moved to quinone A and quinone B sequentially. And eventually they get out of the uh, photosystem too and goes to the plastokinon. Then the uh, plastokinon, reduced plastokinon, uh, goes to the uh, the other next compound called cytochrome B6F. Then this cytochrome B6F uh, cycle this plastokinon redox state. This is called plastokinon pool Q cycle and makes the plastokinon pool. And eventually the electron goes to plastocyanin. And this uh, electron goes to eventually to uh, P700, which is a reaction center chlorophyll A of photosystem one. This is still an oxidant, but not strong oxidant. A little bit redox potential is higher to the minus direction. Then this uh, P700 chlorophyll A get the um, light energy and excited into P700 star. That's a quite reducing uh, compound here, makes the strong reductant. Then after, the, after that, this electron goes to uh, other uh, electron transport chain and eventually goes to the ferrodoxin. Ferrodoxin is a small protein molecule which is cl quite close to uh, uh, cytochrome and plus cyanine. Very similar they, they are. But then uh, it gives these electrons to NADP. Uh, and then this NADP gonna be NADP plus. So, okay, so this is a phot phot photo reaction. What is the importance of photo reaction is making a very strong oxidant which can oxidize the water and also making a strong reductant which can reduce NADP to make an energy which is which is the most important part of the uh, uh, photosystems. Then this is actually a quite conceptual uh, diagram uh, to to explain the uh, redox potential of the uh, photosystems. But uh, uh, and on actual cytochrome membrane here. How it looks like the photosystem two and photosystem one and uh, cytochrome B6 compounds. This is something like that. Photosystem two is a very big protein, uh, comp uh, protein, how to say, hyper uh, a protein complex, hyper protein complex is something like that. So, P680 is on uh, subunit A of this photosystem. This is chlorophyll A here. And water oxidizing uh, occurs in the uh, luminal part of the uh, cyropod membrane, so inside the cyropod membrane, ox uh, water oxidizing reaction occurs by catching the light energy. And electron will be moved to firefighting, kinon A, kinon B, and plus to kinon. Plus kinon is always within the uh, cytochrome membrane. This blue part, uh, purple part is a cytochrome membrane. This is outside of the cytochrome membrane. This, and this is uh, inside of the cytochrome membrane. And cytochrome B6F com uh, compounds, uh, com uh, complex, get this plus kinon uh, and makes the uh, redox reaction of the plus kinon. At this time, uh, proton 
is pumped up from the stroma to the lumen of the sarcoid membrane by this uh, plasquinone reactions. And then plasquinone energy, uh, plasquinone electron is eventually passed to plasticine and the plasticine goes to the uh, photosystem one. The photosystem one has a profile A out on the P700 and then uh, this chlorophyll A get the uh, light uh, energy and the electron will be again moved to other electron transporting chain and eventually goes to the ferrodoxin at the stroma side. And at the stroma side, uh, this ferrodoxin reduces NADP producing NADPH. And this proton also have a, a very important role it goes to the ATP synthase on the saracoid membrane. And this proton will get through the, the uh, part of this ATP synthase. At that time, this ATP synthase rotate. And then this rotation, so proton gradient is converted into the rotation energy in this protein complex. And this rotation energy is transmitted to this site. This is the ATPS enzyme site. Then ADP and uh, phosphorus just combined with the rotational energy, and then ATP is produced. And this ADPH and ATP is used uh, for uh, the CO2 fixation reaction in the uh, CO2 reducing uh, reaction. Uh, actually, this is this uh, figure shows the completely same thing as this cartoon, but this is more a uh, realistic structure, which is determined by X-ray crystallography. This is saracoid membrane, the outside of the saracoid membrane and inside saracoid membrane, and photosystem two is looks something like that and cytochrome B6F complex looks like that. And uh, uh, photosystem one looks like that, and ATPS looks like, like that. Um, please hold on. Hi. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so on the cytochrome membrane here in the chloroplast, there's such kind of very big protein complexes, which makes the uh, light energy conversion into the electron movement here and here. And the electron is passed through these complexes and then eventually makes the NADPH and ADP. In some time of the condition, this electron movement is interrupted. Then when they do not really want to make the uh, uh, NADPH a lot, but they need when they need uh, only ATP. They just uh, circularize the uh, electron movement only in the uh, system one and cyclone B6F, something like that. Epsilon only moves up, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Then they do not uh, consume uh, electron to reduce NADP, but instead they just uh, uh, only makes the uh, proton gradient, which only makes the ATP. That is called uh, a cyclic uh, photophosphorylation. Oh, oh, actually, this is a, a linear electron flow. This is called linear electron flow, and this is called cyclic electron flow. Linear electron flow makes both NADPH and ATP, which is used for the CO2 fixation. And this one, this one only makes the ATP when they do not really need a six CO2 fixation, but only need the ATP. This kind of uh, shortcut of the electron flow happens. Uh, this is this process is called uh, cyclic electron flow. Yeah. Then after making NADPH and ATP, what is gonna happen? That is a CO2 reducing cycle. Now the name is carbon cycle. This carbon cycle reaction is discovered by uh, Melvin Calvin. 
and then Andrew Benson and James Basham. And then Melvin Carvin, only Melvin Carvin uh, got the Nobel Prize uh, from this uh, uh, research. So what they did is, uh, what, what they did is, 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 uh, is that they discovered uh, how ATP and NADPH from food system is used in the CO2 fixation. They carried out the pulse chase experiment using lollipop and chlorosis, which, which is something really <laughs> ununderstandable names, right? But maybe you know chlorella. Chlorella is a, a green alga, which can, which is a single cell uh, photosynthetic photosynthetic organ, uh, organisms lives in uh, a pond and soil and uh, maybe surface of the wood. And lollipop is uh, this grassware, the name of this grassware, nickname of this grassware. This grassware looks like a lollipop candy, which is why it is called lollipop. But then you can see the uh, greenish part here, right? This greenish part is a is, is, uh, you know, solution of chloral cells, suspension of chloral cells and shed light the chloral cells uh, and let chloral cells do a, a photosynthesis in this vessel. That is our experimental system. And then uh, Carbin's group uh, flushes the um, CO2 into this lollipop uh, grassware with carbon-14 CO2 for very, very brief time from one to 30 seconds. That is called pulse chase experiment. Then, then after a very short time of the giving radioactive CO2, carbon-14 C is uh, radioactive. They produces the uh, beta lay, uh, beta lay. Actually, carbon dioxide we always emit is uh, composed of uh, 12 carbon, 12 carbon, C, uh, 12 CO2. That is not radioactive. And also carbon has the other uh, isoform, which is called uh, carbon-13, which is pretty stable one. Doesn't emit the uh, radio, uh, radio ray. Uh, but carbon-14 CO2 uh, very slowly uh, corrupts, emitting the uh, beta ray radioactivity. So the radioactive CO2 is supplied to this uh, chlorosis in lollipop for very short time. And after a certain short time, maybe second, in, in few seconds, the chlorosis is poured to hot ethanol here. This is a very hot ethanol here. And then uh, chlorosis photosynthesizing with Radioactive CO2 is instantaneously killed in uh, ethanol. And then they, uh, these guys uh, analyze the uh, organic acids within this uh, ethanol by drying up ethanol and doing the uh, paper chromatography and did the, uh, you know, work uh, and, and then looking for where the radioactivity exists. That is called autoradiography. But anyway, uh, they found that within two seconds, radioactivity of carbon-14 CO2 get into three phosphoglycerate compounds, three PJ, which is that, that. And then this carbonyl carbon became very, very radioactive in this experiment in a very, very short time. But very interestingly, other carbon was also slightly radioactive. So their interpretation is something like that. Okay, carbon-14 CO2 is directly fixed into this carbonyl carbon. But this 3PGA probably uh, 
metabolized and partly became a uh, acceptor of CO2 again. So it is a cycle that what they, they thought, which is why this carbonyl is metabolized and transferred into different, di different carbon skeletons and eventually became a uh, CO2 acceptor. Then this CO2 acceptor X and CO2 after binding will be become a three PGA, three carbon compounds. Then they initially thought that this X is a uh, two carbon compounds because it produces three carbon, right? The CO2 is one carbon. So X should be a two carbon. That's what they said, they thought. But they never find the, these two carbon compounds in this uh, lollipop experiment. So that really uh, puzzled them. What is the X? Then what what they did is uh, uh well what they did is quite interesting. Uh, they thought that if they stop the uh, carbon dioxide in this reaction uh, system, then probably this X will accumulate and this 3PGA uh, will be reduced in the amount. Then if they stop the light in this reaction, they thought that X and CO2 reaction, uh, binding reaction will proceed, but 3PGA will, wouldn't be uh, uh, reduced into the uh, starch uh, after, after fixed. So 3PGA will accumulate by in the dark and uh, X will be uh, reduced, uh, decreased in the dark. Then they did the, uh, this experiment, stopping CO2 and stopping light. Then they found the very, very uh, strong candidate for the X, which is called ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate which is abbreviated into RBP, but it is called ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. So the compound X is ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. It's a five carbon compound. Five carbon compound bind with carbon dioxide, becoming an intermediate of seven carbon, uh, six carbon compounds, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Then this part would be cut after this by water addition. And then hydrate intermediate split into the uh, two three phosphoglycerate. So the reaction was not like a two plus one equals three. It was five plus one equal two times three carbon, something like that. Five plus one is two three carbon compounds. This is a very, very fast reaction of the CO2 fixation. Then after making a 3PGA, uh, this is a, yeah, a carbon cycle is divided, divided into three parts. One is a carboxylation, which is this reaction. It's a really beginning of the carbon cycle. CO2 fixation and making a 3PGA. And, and after that, this 3PGA is reduced into hexose, which is a sugar, by using ATP and NADPH. This ATP and NADPH comes from the uh, photoreaction and producing ADP and NADP plus. Then this ADP and NADP plus again go back to the photoreaction and convert it into ATP and NADPH. That kind of cycle will, will happen. And, the deduction keep going on, makes making making a uh, 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 hexoses. Then after uh, making a hexose with the sugar, uh, these you know compounds will be regenerated into the uh, ribulose one five bisphosphate. That is a carbon cycle. I will, I will just read it. ADP and NADP plus produced in this process will get back to photochemical reaction to produce ATP and NADP that I explained already. This is an extremely important process for 
a continu continuity of photosynthesis as choking of this process stopped the airborne flow in the photosy uh, photosystem ends up to be over reduction of photosystem. So light comes to the photosystem always. So this light energy uh, should be moved to towards the uh, carbon cycle to fix CO2. But if CO2 doesn't come in this carbon cycle, then light energy cannot go anywhere. Uh, it's, it makes the uh, reactive oxygen species. So light, light energy is given to the uh, oxygen, which makes the uh, very, very uh, vicious uh, compounds called reactive oxygen species, which uh, kills the uh, many part of the living organisms. Okay, um, this reaction, CO2 fixing reaction here, is uh, catalyzed by the enzyme called ribose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase and oxygenase. There's a slash here, means that this enzyme has a two reaction, carboxylase reaction and oxygenase reaction. Then this uh, enzyme is called Lubisco. Actually, after Calvin discovered this uh, reaction, then enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is discovered really quickly because this enzyme is very abundant. Um, actually, for instance, if you eat spinach, the soluble protein of the 60% 60, 60 of soluble protein is Lubisco. So very, very large amount of this enzyme is accumulated in land plants. Not in alga though. Uh, alga doesn't have that much uh, Lubisco, but in the land plants, uh, this Lubisco enzyme is a major protein in the soluble fraction. Probably Lubisco is the uh, most abundant protein on the earth. And uh, this Lubisco, uh, yeah, I already talked about that. And it is said that about 16% of all proteins on the earth is a Lubisco, but it is an old estimate. And I, I think uh, now we cannot say 16% 16 more, more, more uh, smaller amount, I think. But anyway, it is uh, any, anyway true that Lubisco is one of the most abundant protein of the earth. The main structure of Lubisco uh, is composed of the large subunit of about uh, 56 kilodalton encoded by chloroplast genome, genome that has uh, eight uh, subunits in one Lubisco and also eight small subunits, which uh, size at 14 kilodalton that is encoded by nuclear genome. So eight plus eight makes the uh, 16 subunit big, big protein. Uh, that is something like that. Um, okay, this is a uh, one large subunit. And in a part of this part of large subunit, there is a reaction center of the uh, CO2 fixation. Closing up this site, you can see the uh, intermediate of CO2 fixation and carbon dioxide fi being fixed here. And also there's a carbon dioxide here with magnesium ion in, in, in it. This is the other uh, carbon dioxide required to activate Rubisco uh, reaction. But it, it is not a carbon dioxide fixed. So two carbon dioxide is required for this reaction for each subunit. So this is one large subunit and this is one small subunit. And this, uh, uh, you know, uh, combination of one large subunit and one small subunit uh, surround this uh, one, <laughs> one large subunit and one small subunit and four of these combination is at the half uh, side of the enzyme. And at the other side of the enzyme, same structure uh, also uh, composes uh, 
uh, tetramers. Then these four large subunit, four small subunit uh, components just uh, docking at the middle, right? Then mix the uh, 16 subunit big structure. Then this is the uh, turning model of this small subunit, light subunit, in a, written in a different color. The blue, bluish part is a small subunit, and the uh, yellowish color and the uh, reddish color is a large subunit. And they, they mix the 16 big, big uh, subunit structure. Also, there is a different type of the uh, viscose. Type one is something like that. This this structure is type one. It's most abundant uh, structure is a type 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 one. Most most of the photosynthetic organisms have the type one rubisco. But some uh, bacteria has a type two. Uh, bacteria and uh, dinoflagellate has a type two homodimer of large cell unit uh, rubisco. This is really inefficient bad rubisco enzyme which cannot really fix CO2 very fast. And type 3 enzyme, which uh, probably uh, archaea has, ha has this type of the uh, rubisco, uh, homo uh, decama. Two large subunit is in one place, and there's a five, so homo decama. Time, type 4, that is also uh, rubisco relatives, but it uh, actually it doesn't fix CO2, uh, but it salvages a uh, sulfate from the methionine. So this is the sort of uh, evolutionally uh, converted into different uh, type CO2 fixation and salvage of the uh, methionine. But anyway, um, this rubisco is something like quite complicated structure and has two uh, reaction name, carboxylase and oxygenase. And that, that reaction I previously shown here is a carboxylase reaction because it fixes CO2. But oxygenase reaction, what is the oxygenase reaction? That is fixing oxygen here makes a uh, you know, um, superoxide intermediate and makes one phosphoglycerate, but the other one is not phosphoglycerate. That is uh, called phosphoglycolate, two phosphoglycolate. And once this two phosphoglycolate is made, two phosphoglycolate will be an uh, will, will initiate photorespiration reaction, which is quite unproductive reactions. So once the visco fix oxygen in the same place as CO2 fixation, then CO2 no longer can bind to the uh, reaction center and cannot be fixed, but oxygen instead is fixed and producing the uh, half, producing um, uh, two phosphoglycolate, initiating the uh, photo, uh, respiration, photo respiration reaction. Um, so oxygen definitely uh, is a factor that uh, de de uh, decreases the uh, plant productivity. For instance, if there is a uh, uh, rice plant in front of you, and if and hypothesize that this rice plant can produce a thousand uh, grains when you know the world is only occupied by the uh, carbon dioxide yeah if if they if their rubisco can only fix carbon dioxide then they make the a thousand of rice grains right this is a uh this is a you know a hypothesized case anyway and then if the, but we have only 0.04% CO2 at the moment, and 21% oxygen in our atmosphere. So the rubisco in such atmosphere is always, always uh, exposed to high concentration of oxygen. 
then the BISCO oxidance reaction is always there, uh, reducing the uh, productivity of the LUBISCO. Then by, by uh, doing this kind of uh, carboxylase and oxygenase combination reaction, uh, probably the productivity of rice plants, for instance, get down to the 70%, 60 to 70% of the maximum because of this oxygen reaction. So rice plants, which potentially can make thousand grain, only thousand grains can only make the 700 to 600 grains. That is a sort of, uh, uh, how to say, dilemma of the uh, photosynthesis. Uh, by by the uh, you know the 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 gases com com uh, com uh, gases component ratio uh, in our current atmosphere, but uh, this uh, oxygen reaction is required for the for for plants to survive under uh, dry and uh, high light uh, irradiation, so that is also a necessary reaction the oxygen. Genesis, but it reduces, uh, decreases the productivity. Okay, I want to summarize uh, part one. Uh, photosynthesis is composed of two major components, photochemical reaction and carbon reducing reaction. And photochemical reaction is a system to combat light quantum energy to chemical redox reaction. Carbon reducing reaction is initiated by the BISCO enzyme followed by energetically uphill re reduction into formation of hexos using NADPH and ATP. NADPH and ATP is produced by photochemical reaction and consumed by carbon reducing reaction. The importance of photochemical reaction is to produce highly oxidative state of oxidized water to oxidized water and to produce highly uh, reducing state to synthesize NADPH within the photosystem. In the process of photochemical reaction, about a thousand times a uh, gradient of proton is created across cyclotic membrane. It's uh, almost a uh, thousand times. So acidic pH in the cyclotic lumen, uh, cyclotic interior is pH 5.5, but in a stroma at the time of uh, light irradiation, uh, pH is going to be alkaline at about 8.5 or something in stroma. This pH gradient that is called delta pH is an essential driving force for uh, phosphorylation of ADP, phosphorylation of ADP by a function of thyroidal ATP synthase. Okay, uh, I want to take a five minutes break here. So please come back at uh, in five minutes. Okay, I wanna start again. So is everybody ready? Okay, the second chapter is uh, what are the plant in a wide meaning? Um, the question is, is that one who has leaf, stem and root? It is not actually. Always greenish color? It is not actually. And all evolved in, in the same way? Not, not really. Um, I want to explain the, these issues. Okay. This is a tree of life based upon 16S and 18S ribosomal RNA sequence. And before this, you know, um, phylogeny technique, phylogeny method, methodology using the uh, ribosomal RNA sequence, uh, they just, uh, um, you know, uh, how to say, uh, made the tax, uh, they did the taxonomy uh, but, but by the uh, you know uh, microscope observation and and also um, other you know metabolic observations and many kind of uh, informations, then they they thought that archaea and bacteria and eukarya is is uh, in the same line of the evolution. But after the uh, this sixteen S and eighteen S ribosomal RNA phylogeny uh, come up, then. It is surprising, uh, surprisingly, uh, bacteria and archaea was found to be divided into very, very early stage of the evolution of um, 
living organisms. And then from the branch of the archaea, our eukarya is evolved. So archaea is more directly our uh, close to our ancestor uh, by uh, than bacteria. That is uh, the first bi uh, bi biggest change of the, our uh, common sense in uh, evolution. Um, then, but also after that, we uh, now know that um, in in uh, evolution of eukarya, at first there is a stab establishment of nucleus. Uh, so eukaryotes means the organisms which has a nuclear and the organs, right? Then nucleus should be uh, evolved at the beginning, and also they have a, we have a mitochondria in in our body, right? That is a form of alpha proteobacteria. Then also cyanobacteria bacteria get into the uh, uh, cells and making the uh, uh, you know plant. That is called endosymbiosis. But this uh, branch uh, made by the uh, 16S and ADS for the eukarya uh, is not that simple actually. By uh, making a more more uh, uh, precise uh, uh, taxonomic uh, analysis, now we know that uh, eukarya is divided into at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight crates, very big crates, and at each crate of the those. Uh, evolutionary tree, uh, there is a colored branch here, like this. This colored branch means that they have a chloroplast. That means they can do photosynthesis. So uh, photosynthesizing cells, uh, which we, we call now uh, plants, uh, is very, very widespread. And the plants we can see around us is is only placed in here. It's a green lineage and land plant is here. And only this branch, Opistoconta uh, and Amebozoa, does not have the uh, colored branch. And then we, you know, mammals uh, is in this uh, branch. And also many, many uh, former model, model organisms like uh, nematode and uh, that dictyosterium and uh, mouse and uh, yeast and the, all those kind of uh, model uh, organisms is belongs to this office plant. Only, ex only exception of the model plant is a uh, model uh, organism is, is the uh, uh, Arabidopsis sariana, that belongs to this land plant. But all other eukarya is not really uh, uh, researched and also uh, uh, written on the text uh, at the molecular level. So then these, you know, colored branch uh, stuff is uh, classified into secondary symbionts. And some of them are known to be vital factor for human life and or environment. Photosynthetic organisms exist in all group except opist content available, right? And this is a primary end symbiosis branch. Uh, after getting the chloroplast from uh, uh, cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria became a chloroplast. And then this plant branch of the first primary end symbiosis after first primary end symbiosis divided into three types of the photosynthetic organisms, which is called glycophyte and, and uh, 
Blanco fight and Lodo fight and uh, 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 Lolo fight. Then from this Lodo fight, for instance, Lodo, Lodo fight you carry out, get into the other organisms, becoming a secondary uh, chloroplast, making uh, heterocont fights and uh, cryptophytes and haptophytes. Also, uh, green alga became a, a secondary chloroplast of eugreonoids and uh, chlorolacneophytes and part of the dinoflagellate. These are called secondary endosymbiosis. In some organisms, such as dinoflagellate, get uh, chloroplasts from these secondary organisms, like uh, cryptophytes and haptophytes and heterocontophytes, uh, making a tertiary uh, endosymbiosis. But it is uh, not very common. Um, in the world of the, mainly in ocean, the most abundant one is this secondary uh, and the symbio or and the symbiotic photosynthesizing organisms, which has which acquire the um, uh, chloroplast from uh, uh, mainly lodophyte. Okay, um, some uh, interesting characteristics of these uh, groups will be written here. For instance, the ancestor of land plant is chlorophyte, only chlorophyte. So land plants came from the only chlorophyte, the very, very small branch of the plant. A single accidental event of symbi symbiosis of the cyanobacteria resulted in the establishment of primary plastid, and which is why the land plants uh, chlorophyte and glycophyte and lodophyte is a single lineage. But uh, the other plants belongs to many different groups, uh, which is not related to each other, actually. The genome structure is quite different each other. Uh, this is because of their incorporation of chloroplasts by multiple stage uh, in, in, uh, in the symbiosis, such as secondary in symbiosis and tertiary in symbiosis. Um, I, first, Euganoid is physio, uh, phylogenetically very close to African sleeping sickness protozoa. That, that is called Trypanosoma. Trypanosoma is here and Euganoid is here. One, Euganoid is photosynthetic organisms, but Trypanosoma is, uh, is a disease causing uh, 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 um, protozoa. That is interpreted like that. Eugrenoids obtained a green algae in the late stage of this evolution uh, group. So they evolved in the same way to here, but then eugrenoids get the uh, green uh, alga for the chloroplast and they, they uh, quit the um, uh, parasitic uh, life. But then similar thing, but opposite way happened around here. This group contains a success, uh, okay, malaria parasite protozoa, which is called Apicomplexa, also belongs to this group. Uh, some, somewhere around here, mar there is a malaria parasite. And malaria parasite possesses a beige, uh, vestigial, oh, that, that is a sort of, uh, um, how to say, blue uh, in the organelle. Uh, of frosted. Um, that has a rubisco in it and also has a very different, uh, very, very similar reactions to the uh, plant uh, chloroplast, uh, indicating uh, that it is originally, malaria is, was originally an alga, but they uh, chosen a uh, parasitic life, then lost the uh, uh, photosynthesis. And also, uh, this is going to be a main topic of this uh, lecture. This group contains successful marine habitats. For example, diatoms, uh, heterocont algae like a kelp, and uh, yeah, like kelp is responsible for up to um, 
20% uh, of annual global six, uh, CO2 fixation uh, on the Earth. Okay. Um, this uh, plant has a. Okay. Uh, what are you uh, talking about? Okay. These, you know, uh, plants is quite diverse and also has a diverse pigment for the photosynthesis. This already I showed chloroplast uh, A and B and C and D, right? And then uh, this C and the C2 and C3 is quite uh, widespread in these organisms. And besides, uh, all photosynthetic organisms has a carotenoid. Beta carotene in, is in all photosynthetic organisms and also lutein and uh, uh, fucosantin and perinidin. Uh, lutein, lutein and neoxanthin is, is in, in uh, uh, green plants, but fucosantin and uh, perinidin, fucosantin is in uh, diatom and haptophyte, and diadoxanthin is in uh, diatom and haptophyte, and perinidin, that is in, in uh, dinoflagellate, that is this one. Fucosantin and uh, diadoxanthin is in this uh, organisms. They play the quite uh, important roles for harvesting protein and also dissipating the uh, light energy to the heat. Also, uh, the other pigment is called phycobilins. Uh, there's a bunch of different type of chemically modified uh, phycobilins, like uh, uh, phycocyanobilin, phycobilin, and uh, phycoerythrobilin. Fico urobilin and uh, fico erythrobilin and fico urobilin too. Um, these are more and abundant in uh, used in in these you know lodophyte and uh, glycophyte, but lost in other all other uh, photosynthetic organisms and also uh, cyanobacteria has this uh, fico So this was quite fico is quite ancient. Uh, uh, Photosynthetic pigment, but lost in the evolution of diverse uh, photosynthetic organisms in the history, uh, evolutionary history. But you know, these uh, pigment biosynthesis pathway is quite uh, related to each other. Um, it comes from uh, this one is uh, glutamate uh, converted into delta amino. Uh, labelinic acid, and then this two amino labelinic acids makes the uh, porphyrinogen, something like that. And four porphyrinogen makes a tetrapyl that I said before that this single pentagonal structure is called pyrrole, and four pyrroles means tetrapyrrole, right? And this this tetrapyrrole was uh, circularized to make the uh, core porphyrinogen three. And then this core porphyrinogen 3 uh, chelate magnesium and makes the uh, magnesium porphyrin. And the other in, in the other way, they are cut, then become a phycobilins. And this this side, circularized and chelating magnesium at the middle, it, it gonna become a uh, chlor chlorophyll. And then from mebaronic acid. Uh, that that is from uh, acetyl core A, mebaronic acid, and isopentene diphosphate makes the uh, carbohydrate chains longer and longer, and eventually it's gonna be a, a carotenoid. But part of the precursor of carotenoid getting to the biosynthesis pathway of the chloroplast, uh, chlorophylls, and then chlorophyll get the fetal from it. Okay, uh, so. so yeah. So Matsuda san. Yeah. I think it's time to take a rest. Uh we will continue. I already take a rest five five minutes, so I No no, I mean uh we have uh two session. We ah. have uh twenty minutes we will have uh a rest. So we continue twenty minutes later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will take a rest again. So oh, okay. So Maybe. we continue. Uh, I I do not do the uh a uh, uh, regular way of the Okay. taking a rest.
Okay, thank you. So yeah, yeah. Okay, this file comes from the Carlton Nebel Synthesis Pathway, something like that. And um, you know, this 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 base, yeah, phyto comes from the Carlton Nebel Synthesis Pathway. So all photosynthetic pigments relate each other. Then this can be found in these diverse groups. You know, diverse groups has different type of the uh, photosynthetic pigment, but it's really well reflects the uh, way they, how they evolved. So for instance, greenish plant has a chlorophyll A, B, and cotton 1, 2, and uh, secondary in the symbiosis that get the uh, green uh, chloroplast has very similar photosynthetic pigment. But uh, uh, lodophyte lineage uh, lost phycobilium, but they have a uh, uh, similar uh, chlorophyll A, C type uh, uh, photosynthetic structure uh, in, uh, each other. Okay. So I, okay, I will take a list here. <laughs> and I summarize this, uh, the second part. Living organisms are divided into three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And the evolution of eukarya is sustained by all organization of uh, prokaryote by end symbiosis. Eukaryote had undergone an extreme diversi diversification by multiple uh, symbiosis between eukaryote and uh, eukaryote and eukaryote. Especially plastic evolution is widespread, establishing a variety of food autotrophs in distant taxa. The secondary end symbiosis organisms contains the vital factors for human life health and our scale environment. The pigment components in each photo autotopes well reflect their evolutions, evolutional state and the biosynthesis pathways of this pigment is closely uh, related. Okay, so I want to take a break for five minutes again. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you very five, much. Five, 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 five. I will take that. that way. It is okay. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, okay. audience, <laughs> so please, uh, you can take uh, five minutes. Uh, please join again five minutes later on. Yeah. Thank you very much. What do you mean, huh? Yeah. Okay, Sensei, please. Okay. I, I'm gonna yeah, start. I already record the game. I'm gonna start about uh, what is that? And this is the main topic of this uh of my lecture. Okay. Diadem was actually previously in here, actually. And that is quite important organism, actually. The, uh, how it is evolved and how different is this organism from land plant. That, that what that's what I I, I gonna explaining um okay first uh evolution of uh photo autotopes on the earth is something summarized like that this is a, a chronological table this is the current and then this is a, a bus of us which is uh 40 600 million years ago and then uh, at first, Cyanobacteria ancestor was evolved at about 30, 30 to 3500 million years ago. Then they uh, start evolving oxygen, which is which means that uh, they start using the uh, water, very abundant water, uh, for the electron source, right? That that's what I already explained. And then uh, proteobacteria, which is the ancestor of mitochondria, also evolved at the, at the time. Then a um, uh, you know th this become a mitochondria, and the cyanobacteria became uh, becoming uh, is become the, the uh, chloroplast, chloroplast of primary in the, in the symbiosis, which is chlorophyte, uh, mainly chlorophyte and chlorophyte, and in part gly glycophyte. That's what I already explained, which is about um 10 to 1500 million years ago then secondary and symbiosis uh start very popular at about four to five hundred million years ago which is more recent and then also at the same time land plants uh start evolving and this graph 
blue line is uh, oxygen concentration uh, uh, in the atmosphere that we can uh, search from the uh, fossils. And that also this is a carbon dioxide concentration. As you can see, very, very high concentration of oxygen and very, very low concentration of carbon dioxide happens in this time. That is due to the photosynthesis, actually. Photosynthetic organisms doesn't like oxygen and doesn't really love CO2. But they produce oxygen, they consume CO2, right? Then high amount of oxygen makes the photorespiration. So in this time, the plants, because of the atmospheric component that they made, plants made this kind of very extreme atmospheric uh, conditions, but they were suffered by that. Very high oxygen prohibit uh, the photosynthesis, right? Then at that time, probably they start evolving CO2 concentrating mechanism. And the atoms started really uh, recently, which is about 200 million years ago. And also haptophyte and uh, chrysophyte also here, uh, evolved in the ocean quite recently. Um, okay, after the uh, 250 million years ago, at that time, the land shape and in, on the earth was something like that. They that that continent drift really uh, vi vi rigorously at that time, which means that the ocean environment changes year by year quite a lot. Then the atom started around that time. First, uh, radial centric diatom, which is quite big diatoms, uh, have evolved, and then small, more smaller, and uh, uh, has has more smaller and has a lot of uh, dots here. Uh, uh, started evolve, which is called multipolar centrics. And then uh, line symmetrical shape uh, one, which is called arafidopenate, was evolved at about uh, 80, uh, 8, 8, 8, no, 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 0. 0.800 million years ago means <laughs> what it is, um, 80 million years ago, yeah. 80 million years ago, uh, Arafidopenet diatom evolved, and finally, Lafidopenet diatom has evolved at about 40 million years ago. Lafidopenet diatom can move on the surface of the rock. They, they have some sort of a caterpillar uh, to move on the surface. But anyway, th those diatoms uh, can, can do uh, all photosynthesis quite well. And they have probably evolved the uh, uh, quite quite different type of the uh, uh, CO two acquisition system depending upon the changing of the um, environment. Okay, because the atom is a secondary end symbiont, the uh, cellular structure is quite complicated. Um, by primary in the symbiosis, sand bacteria is engulfed by the uh, nuclear origin uh, host and becoming a plast uh, plastid, which is a chloroplast. By having the, their own uh, cell membrane of sand bacteria and also a cell membrane, a membrane that is formed by engulfment, uh, then chloroplast of uh, primary uh, endosymbiosis uh, become two layers of the membrane structure. But then these, you know, eukaryotic photosynthetic organism again eaten by other host, then their membrane structure is gonna be more complicated. This this gonna be a chloroplast, right? So this will be a uh, engulfment membrane and uh, original uh, uh, cellular membrane and uh, chloroplast membrane would be formed within the uh, one chloroplast. So chloroplast in the secondary and symbionts is quite complicated and more layered as compared to the primary and symbionts. Primary and symbionts only has a, a two-layered chloroplast envelope, but 
uh, secondary enzyme bions like diatom has a two outer membrane first. Outer membrane is two, which is called chloroplastic ER. Outermost membrane is fused with uh, normal ER and also a nucleo nucleus membrane. And the uh, second two membrane is uh, called uh, chloroplast envelope. So in total, there's one, two, three, four, four layers of the chloroplast membrane. So it's quite, quite complicated structure they have as a uh, chloroplast structure. And also the morphology is quite interesting. Uh, centric diatom has uh, this kind of upper upper uh, like a petri dish petri dish upper half of the uh very cent centric <laughs> like a petri dish anyway uh and has a you know very uh, uh, uh fine structure of the the uh, biomineralized silicate like this so morphology that, that is called fluster this is, this is actually a cell wall made by silicate which is grass, actually. Sil silicate is grass, right? So this is a grass shelled, uh, very finely fabricated cell, the uh, diatomus. So I agree it. Diatom has a cell wall made of biomineralized silicate that is called fluster. The morphology of fluster is completely a point or line symmetrical. So point symmetrical is called centrix. And line symmetrical is called pennant. And the surface of the fluster is filled with nanometer order arrange structure. That is called areola. If we see really uh, fine with a fine uh, resolution electron micrograph, we can see this kind of uh, fractal structure made by glass. That is called areola. The overall fluster structure is uh, reproduced by generation to generation and species to species. So meaning that the morphology is imprinted in diatom genome. And the fluster is composed of two main parts, like a petri dish. So it has a, you know, upper, upper cap and lower cap. Yeah. So upper, upper cap is called AB valve and lower cap is called hyperbulb, and that is hinged by girdles. That is a, a structure of diatom cell. And the, when diatom cell divide, they make the uh, lower cap, smaller cap to each caps, like that. So this colored one is a newly composed newly formed uh, caps, bulbs. Then, as you can see, they divide and their size be becomes uh, smaller. That is a pretty uh, interesting part of the diatom. So this big diatom after several generations becomes something like that. So it, it can't be really smaller and smaller because they make the uh, smaller caps always to the uh, bigger caps. Then after they get into the hit into the size limitation, then they start reproducing, mixing, mix, make, making, making an egg, making an egg and sperms, and becoming a bigger cells again. That is a sperm egg of the centric diatom tachycyra, and this is a gamet gametate uh, of the. Yeah, actually, reproducing organs of the uh, penetrant diatom pseudonychia, and they make the oxyspore and becomes bigger cells again. That's a quite interesting uh, um, life cycles of the diatoms. And genome of diatom is quite interesting. Genome of diatom is was firstly uh, 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 analyzed by. Chris Bola and Ginger Armbrust in 2004 and 2008, which is actually quite new history of the genome uh, uh, genome database. Um, the recently, Thomas Mock also made uh, discovered uh, our 
the other atoms and several atoms are already genome sequenced now. But anyway, from the genome sequence, we discovered the numerous animal type genes is in uh, chloroplast as well as plant type genes. So half and half almost. And also it is very noteworthy that there's very many orphan genes, more than 3000. Orphan genes means that that gene sequence does not similar to any sequence of any organisms. It's a diatom specific sequence. There's more than 3000, orphans, 3423 in Pheodactylum and uh, 3193 and Tachyosyra pseudomonas. Tachyosyra pseudomonas is this, this cells, and Pheodactylum trigonitum is this cells. So, for instance, if, if this, this gene sequence is not similar to any gene sequence, so of course the function is completely unknown. So if one uh, doctor student work on one gene for three years, we need more than 3,000 PhD students to solve all function of these uh, genes. So there's lots of things to do uh, for the, atom, uh, the atoms. And these uh, orphan genes probably ha uh, has a very important uh, regional uh, role uh, for the atoms to live in uh, seawater. Um, okay, two species shares only 28 to 30% genes. That, that is pretty similar to the difference of, between human and fish. So in one species, the atom has such a different uh, organization of the genome, uh, means that the atom is quite diverse uh, species. And potential species number uh, is now predicted up to uh, 200,000, one of the most diverse classes of organisms that Adam is. And also, um, the Adams took the uh, genes from the green alga. Probably, we, th we think that, we just assume that before red alga get into the atom, ancestral cells as a chloroplast. There's a chloroplast come from the green alga. But after getting the uh, red alga chloroplast, this green type chloroplast was just uh, get rid of the cells and take over the load by the uh, red alga chloroplast. But before the green chloroplast getting out of the diatom cells, they moves their gene into the nucleus. So the atom nuclear gene, encoding the chloroplast, chloroplast walking gene of 60% of chloroplast, uh, about 60% of nuclear encoded chloroplast gene is related to green alga. While 5%, only 5% uh, nuclear encoded chloroplast gene is red type. So, yeah, this, this means that they may have incorporated green alga as initial chloroplast before being taken over by the red chloroplast. That, that is our hypothesis. And also they have a, a functional urea cycle. It's op op operational. And plants doesn't have a urea cycle. We have urea cycle to, to make a pea. But uh, plant doesn't have a urea cycle, but the atom has urea cycle. And so which is very, very... Uh, how to say, uh, animal type uh, metabolism they have. And the fatty acid beta oxidation happens in mitochondria. In, in the land plants, fatty acid oxidation only occurs in the uh, pauxisome. But in the atom, it occurs in mitochondria. And also our fatty acid oxidation occurs in mitochondria, which is also animal-like. The almost complete set of glycolytic pathway is in both cytosol and uh, plastid. That means also downstream part of glycolytic pathway in the mitochondria also. So they have, uh, they get a lot of uh, cell compartment from different organisms. So their metabolism is still there. It is complicated metabolism, a redundant metabolism they have. 
but probably this kind of redundancy of the metabolism uh, probably worked uh, for diatoms to be successful in the ocean environment that we thought. Also, uh, these, um, okay, okay, I already talk about that. And also diatoms got the uh, genes from bacteria a lot uh, in, the, in the evolutionary history. So datum genome is rich in green type and uh, red type genes and also bacterial type genes together with, with animal type genes. So datum's genome is quite, uh, how to say, mosaic of many uh, genome origin. Okay, I just mentioned that a number of green type, red, red type uh, chloroplast uh, protein is encoded in the nucleus. What that means is that quite simple actually. After chloroplast is established, chloroplast origin just move the, their genome to the nucleus so that chloroplast cannot divide and uh, do their own function uh, independently to the host cells. So chloroplast is completely controlled by the uh, uh, host cells, nucleus. Right. One of the phenomena uh, to show that is the uh, number of chloroplast gene is encoded in the nucleus. So probably 2,000 to 3,000 proteins is working in the chloroplast, but only 130 something around 130 genes is in, uh, 130 proteins is encoded in the chloroplast. So 3,000 to 130. So chloroplastic gene only explains very, very little of the chloroplast metabolism, right? And more than 95% gene is encoded and come from the uh, nucleus and cytosol into the chloroplast. How the protein get into the chloroplast is quite imp important uh, issue uh, to explain the, the organization of the chloroplast in the atoms. They have four layered chloroplast membrane, and they use the uh, two uh, signal sequence at end terminus of the protein. One is a signal peptide, which normally used for the uh, 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 excretion of the protein to, to outside of the cells in mammals. But they use it for the same signal of e, uh, to go to the endoplasmic reticulum uh, to go to the chloroplast envelope. The first envelope is called uh, CE, uh, chloroplast ER. They use this ER signal to uh, sort the protein into the um, chloro, uh, chloroplast envelope, the outer chloroplast envelope, which is called chloroplast ER. Then they use ASAFAP motif uh, to get through the other next two membranes. So that is called a chloroplast envelope, right? I already talked about that. Yeah. This is a chloroplast ER. They they use ER signal. This is ER. They, they use the same ER signal. Then then this ER signal is accompanied by other signal to get through the, the, the next two membranes. So, so four membrane, the protein can pass through this four membrane to be functional within the chloroplast. Yeah. So I want to summarize the, the chapter three. Diatoms are the most recently evolved for the autos of the so and the evolution is accompanied by drastic changes and environment with continent drift. Diatom cell is covered by silica cell wall that is called frustro, and their cell size. Uh, reduces as generation proceed. Diatoms restore their cell size by sexual reproduction. As consequence of uh, multiple endosymbiosis, diatom genome is enriched by a variety of genes originated from many organisms. This enrichment of genome enabled operations of animal-like metabolism and redundant typification of housekeeping metabolism across organisms, which is sold to contribute to uh, their successfulness in, in ocean eco ecosystem, actually. The 
uh, secondary corpus of the atom possesses four envelopes. Protein traffic from cytosol to chloroplast is regulated by excitosis like meta mechanism, followed by a unique chloroplast transit system that is that's just like called the exocytosis signal of ER and followed by a datum specific uh, amino acid motif sequence. And we already talked about that. Then the secondary chloroplast might still be in part treated as the outside compartment of the host cell. That is quite an interesting part of the uh, system. Okay, I want to take five minutes rest. So please come back at 20. Okay, thank you very much. Now I get thirsty. <laughs> Again. Okay, please. Okay, um, now I want to talk about uh, the atom photosynthesis and uh, CO2 concentrating mechanism. So what, how important it is and uh, how the atom deal with CO2, that is the issue of this chapter four. Okay, um, the beginning of genome era of the atom research uh, that research is uh, actually started from the discovery of ocean infrastructure uh, utilizing the space technology using the satellite. That this satellite is called C-STASI -C Viewing Wide Field of View Sensor that is called, uh, abbreviated to uh, C-WIPES. And then this uh, C-WIPES uh, can actually uh, analyze the uh, light reflected from the uh, the surface of the of the Earth, and also they can shed the laser beam uh, to the surface surface of ocean, and they can see the uh, dispersion of the light shed on the uh, on the water. Light dispersion means that. You know, light dispersion is depending upon the, the, the diameter of particle in, in that place. So if there is uh, several micrometer uh, particles, then they diverse in certain amount. Uh, that, not like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> disperse, they disperse in, in a certain amount. And if the uh, the diameter become twice larger, then the light dispersion become four times. So uh, the size to two uh, is, is uh, you know, um, dispersion effect. So by seeing the dispersion, they can estimate how big the organism is there. And also by analyzing the reflect light from the surface ocean, they can see how much uh, chlor chlorophyll is in that place. That changed the game of biogeochemistry by spectrometry of global surface uh, with remote sensing, that is called remote sensing satellite. Previously, uh, the, previously uh, the remote sensing satellite, be before the remote sa sensing satellite appears, we have to just go to this ocean point by uh, vessels and take the uh, water from there and see how many organisms there. That is a way uh, we can we can do. Uh, then in that way, we can only get the information of point to point, right? But the ocean is so wide that we cannot really see uh, the full picture of the uh, ocean. But by doing, by using this kind of remote sensing satellite, we can analyze everything uh, from the sky uh, by by a surface, right? We have a big area. Then this remote sensing satellite gives this result in two, uh, 1997. That is called Darwin Project. Okay, by analyzing the uh, absorption spectra and also dispersion spectra, 
they just divide the absorption spectra with the uh, dispersion spectra and uh, figure out how wh how big organisms is doing how many photosynthesis in each area. And they colored that various uh, differently. Lead means diatoms. Blue means pecoplankton. And uh, that is cyanobacteria, actually. And green means Prochlorococcus. It is. It's a. It's a relative of the uh, cyanobacteria, but very small, uh, very active photosynthetic organisms. And yellow is a large phytoplankton, other than uh, diatoms. As you can see, these red patches appear seasonally in southern and northern hemisphere. It's quite dense. From this uh, observation, uh, they. The, yeah, the group and MIT and other three groups in the in the in the world uh, collaborative uh, team concluded that uh, ocean primary production primary production is is nearly equal to photosynthesis. Ocean primary production is at least half of the global primary production. So half of CO two fixation occurs in the ocean. And diatoms' uh, contribution for, for the ocean productivity is probably up to 40% of the total, which means that up to 20% annual global production is down by diatoms. So diatoms photosynthesis is a very, very big fraction of the uh, uh, as, as gas exchange, which is like a lung in our body. So diatom is one of the lung very big lung of the earth. If we, if you are blessed twice, the half oxygen comes from the earth, uh, hum, comes from the ocean, right? If we breathe five times, one uh, breeze is, uh, is one, one breeze oxygen comes from the diatoms, right? So diatoms uh, photosynthesis is quite important fraction of the of the uh, uh, oxygen production in the on the earth, yeah, seasonal change. You know, the atoms fraction is quite big, right? Like this. January is the summertime in uh, uh, the southern hemisphere. The atoms is quite dense here, and then April now warming up. Place uh, time in uh, in uh, you know uh, northern hemisphere. The atoms is reaching here. Good. Carbon concentrating mechanism, CO2 concentrating mechanism. Uh, this CO2 concentrating mechanism in many plants, for instance, sand bacteria uh, has a quite strong bicarbonate transporters and quite strong CO2 converter into bicarbonate that accumulate bicarbonate, which is quite impermeable, the uh, cell, cell, uh, cell membrane, thus can accumulate the uh, bicarbonate inside the cell thousand times more than outside. And then they uh, have a carboxyzone in which there is a Rubisco protein is accumulated, in, accumulated, and they convert bicarbonate only in this area called carboxyzone. And, and, and CO2 is instantaneously fixed by Rubisco. In green alga, uh, they have a uh, bicarbonate transport system at the chloroplast membrane. The bicarbonate accumulated in the chloroplast is converted into uh, CO2 only at the Lubisco condensate point, which is called pyrenoid. The land plants also has a CO2 concentrating mechanism, but it is totally different. Uh, this, uh, in contrast to sand bacterial and uh, green algal, CO2 concentrated mechanism is based upon the CO2 pumping into the uh, chloroplast. They just accumulate C4 uh, organic acid. That, that is called biochemical CCM. That they, they, they use it totally different way. So how about diatom? Diatoms are uh, evolved in a different time of the different land uh, shape, right? As I said before. Um, the atoms probably uh, evolved quite different CCM. Okay. Get one guy. I want to. I want to skip this, please. Uh, okay. And 
but you know, in seawater, uh, cal CO2 concentrations does not exceed 15 micromolar, very 10 to 15 micromolar. That is quite little amount uh, for the photosynthesis by Rubisco. Rubisco requires more, you know, 50, 60 micromolar CO2 to be really uh, functional. So this seawater level carbon dioxide is not enough, but seawater has quite a bit of uh, bicarbonate accumulated. So if they can use the uh, bicarbonate, they, they can do the photosynthesis quite, quite well. <clears throat> then actually diatom uses both CO2 and bicarbonate. Most diatom can use it. Some diatoms doesn't show the CO2 uptake, but most diatoms can take up both CO2 and uh, both, uh, both CO2 and bicarbonate. Then our group, but we did, right, actually we did not know how they get the uh, bicarbonate from the uh, seawater, but we actually uh, discovered one protein transport protein, uh, uh, one protein which may be responsible for transporting bicarbonate from seawater uh, into the cells. That is called solute carrier protein, solute carrier SLC protein 4 and 26. Solute carrier, especially solute carrier 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 4 protein, when cells are growing in high CO2, they do not show the uh, uh, expression. But once cells are transferred to low CO2 condition, then they express the uh, these proteins. So we just uh, um, get this gene, SLC 414244, and then, yeah, did, did some localization by tagging GFP protein to this, uh, GFP protein gene to this uh, SLC proteins. Then, then uh, this gene was introduced into the diatom cells, Phyllodactylum trichonutum cells, and see where the GFP protein goes. That's what we did. Then very clearly, they went to the uh, plasma membrane like that. If we cut here, then it is circulated like that. So it's a plasma membrane protein that we uh, published in PNS 2013. And, and then we just uh, did the uh, four bunches of equilibration uh, modeling and then see, uh, okay, this uh, cells expresses, uh, expresses uh, GFP tagged SLC proteins we can see the difference of this overexpression of SSC4 proteins uh, within the cells. And then this protein is controlled by the uh, CO2 irresponsible, not res the promoter not responding to CO2. So they always express this GFP tagged SSC protein. Doesn't matter what the gross CO2 concentration, but in wild type, uh, as I see show before, uh, this gene is quite responsive to CO2. So once CO2 concentration in seawater is high, this stops the expression of this protein. But in this mutant of having this G GFP tagging SLC4, they always, uh, independent of CO2 concentration in the seawater, they always express this protein of GFP tagged SLC4 too. So we just did the... Uh, experiment that is uh, the measurement of DIC is is stands for dissolved ionic carbon which is CO2 plus bicarbonate and mainly bicarbonate HCO3 minus and in the media we just add uh, 100 micromolar of DIC actually bicarbonate uh, to the cells culture and see how cells can take up the this bicarbonate uh, into the cells to fix CO2 uh, over time. In, this is a uh, high CO2 grown wild type cells and mutant cells. High CO2 grown wild type cells cannot take up uh, the uh, 
bicarbonate from the media, which is why the, the bicarbonate concentration in the media doesn't change. But mutant, which expresses uh, SOC4 uh, gene, can take up quite fast the, the uh, bicarbonate in the media, which is why bicarbonate concentration decreases uh, in the medium. But after cells uh, get used to the low CO2 condition, then wild type and both wild type and SSC4 protein uh, uh, mutant has quite strong bicarbonate transporter. So we cannot distinguish wild type and uh, uh, mutant. But in high CO2 grown cells, because wild type cells represses uh, a C, uh, bicarbonate transporters, then we can see the difference of the mutant. So definitely we found that this protein SOC4 is a, a bicarbonate transport system uh, at the plasma membrane. Yeah, this is the uh, bicarbonate SOC4-2 structure. And this is the uh, uh, SOC4-A1 structure of human being kidney. We also have a quite similar SOC4 protein, which works in our kidney, actually. But they have an N-terminus long stretch, and the Atoms one has doesn't have it. This one probably uh, we need it to, to transmit the signals to other place. But uh, uh, bicarbonate transport area here is quite similar between uh, our system and the, the Atoms system. So probably uh, the Atoms, uh, uh, bicarbonate transporter came from the host nucleus. And that is shared uh, by human being also. Okay, um, I already talked about the cyanobacterial system in here briefly. Yeah, 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 here. Briefly, I just uh, talk a more a little bit more in detail. Okay, cyanobacteria had the kind of some tetrahedral structure like that, but it's actually I uh, 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 something like that, like a very a um, uh, very organized structure of the protein shell. And this part is composed of this yellowish wall of proteins, which has a central hole here. And that central hole has a protein called carbonic anhydrase. And this greenish part is a rubisco protein just underneath the uh, shell protein. The visco protein, the CO2 fixing protein. So, cyanobacterial cells has a uh, bi three bicarbonate transporters, which is called uh, BCT1 and BA and SBTA, all which uh, transport bicarbonate into the cells, and also CO2 diffusing into these cells is converted into bicarbonate quite efficiently by using the electron transport chain. So the bicarbonate is accumulated within the cells, and then this bicarbonate get into this uh, shell structure called carboxyzone through this hole. And this hole, as I said, that there's a carbonic anhydrase enzyme. Carbonic anhydrase enzyme is an enzyme that convert bicarbonate HCO3 to HCO3 minus into CO2 by dehydrating it. So only CO2 is formed at this hole. Then the visco is flooded by CO2 made by this carbonic anhydrase in this place. If the bicarbonate is converted into CO2 in this area, then this CO2 instantaneously leak out because CO2 is very, very leaky uh, molecule because it is very hydrophobic. But HCO3 minus bicarbonate uh, is a charged bigger molecule. It, it, it's never, or not never, but it, it's very, very uh, impermeable for the uh, plasma membrane. 
So they accumulate bicarbonate inside the cells and then convert very leaky CO2 only at the place that Rubisco located. Then Rubisco instantaneously fix CO2 in the carboxyl. That is a, a CO2 concentrating mechanism in, in uh, sand bacteria. But in the case of the uh, 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 eukaryotic plant, they have the other system called pyranoid. This is a chloroplast of diatom. This is a chloroplast of the green algal chlorinomonas. They have some very proteinous body at the central part of the chloroplast. That is called the pyranoid. This is a chloroplast in the brown alga. And they also have a pyranoid structure. But probably this pyranoid structure is a functional analog of the carboxysum in the cyanobacteria, bacteria, but their, their evolution just comes from the completely different origin, I think. But anyway, this uh, structure contains Rubisco uh, within the chloroplast. All Rubisco is condensate in this place. So our model is that uh, in the case of uh, cyanobacteria, they accumulate bicarbonate only bicarbonate converted into the Rubisco space. But in the case of the uh, um, uh, for instance, green algae, they take the bicarbonate into the chloroplast, and bicarbonate is only a, a converted into CO2 at the pyranoid. The pyranoid has a cyanide membrane invaginating or penetrating, uh, penetrating, and then carbon dioxide is only formed in that area, and then CO2 is uh, instantaneously fixed by the BISCO. That is a, a system that uh, drives the uh, efficient photosystem in eukaryotic algae like green alga, chromatomonas, and, and diatoms. Okay, I want to summarize this chapter. Development of uh, space technology uncovered uh, in 1997 that ocean primary production occupies more than 50% of our annual global primary production. And that and photosynthesis is, is responsible up to 20% of total, total global uh, CO2 fixation. Because of limited CO2 solubility to water, aquatic uh, photosynthesis requires to utilize abundant bicarbonate in ocean. Diatoms diversified SLC4 type transporters to take up bicarbonate from seawater. The intercellularly accumulated bicarbonate is transported into stoma by specific chloroplastic SLC4s through to carrier four proteins. And acidic carbonic, uh, acidic carbonic anhydrous in the cyanide lumen works to create an amplifax of CO2 to rubisco, which is accumulated in the pyranoid. Um, yeah, that is a, this part, right? Carbonic anhydrous, I, I just forgot to say that. There's carbonic anhydrous in this thyroid membrane. And then bicarbonate entered into this place, is converted into CO2, and CO2 get out in really quickly from the thyroid membrane and went to the rubisco to be fixed. Something like that, that is summarized here. These me uh, mechanisms of transporters and flux control system of DAC dissolved in any carbon is likely consistent between freshwater green alga and marine diatoms. However, the proteins used in these processes are of totally different origin, indicating the occurrence of an um, extreme convergent evolution of the CCM in these organisms, green and uh, uh, green and green alga and diatoms use a similar mechanism, but with completely different uh, proteins. In the case of diatoms, very uh, unique, newly discovered CETA-type carbonic anhydrase is working in the cyclotron. Actually, this CETA-type carbonic anhydrase is discovered by our laboratory. Okay, I want to uh, take a five minutes break again before going to, so please come back at maybe. Okay, thank you very 50. much. Yeah. Okay.
台風の直撃受けそうです。ん広島ですかいや、あの、okay. はい、お願いします。I'm going to start again.、Um, next, the, the final chapter is、uh, molecular tools and the、uh, technologies of diatom. So, the issue is that life stage of diatom is usually uh, uh, diplodic, di <laughs> diploid. The,、uh, diatom is diploid, actually, usually. And we cannot really control the、uh, sexual reproduction of diatom, actually. It, it is quite difficult. So, it is、uh, very difficult. It used to be very difficult to knock out gene、uh, with conventional method, like, uh, uh, like uh, you know,、um, homologous recombination or you know, gene insertion. Only we could do the、uh, gene high, high, high expression of the gene, but we, we couldn't knock, knock it out. Also, the atom does not accept homologous. I, I already said that. And,、um, How the atoms are, are competent for molecular technology is that there's lots of, lots of improvement recently, and how the atoms will be applied for the technologies that, 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 that is the issue of this、uh, chapter.、Um, okay. okay, we can actually transform the atom. We, can, we couldn't uh, uh, knock out gene before, but we could、uh, transform the atoms with such as gene gun. And also,、uh, electroporation system. Gene gun is a sort of、uh, shotgun of the DNA bullet. So, DNA, DNA is coated onto the uh, uh, metal, small, very, very small metal particles, like a gold particle or a tungsten particle. And this particle is put on the screen, and then、uh, a high pressure helium will be shot on this membrane. And then diatom share is put at the six centimeter distance behind,、uh, below this screen. And then this screen just hits this、uh, stopping screen, which is just a、uh, metal mesh. And then a DNA bullet just shoot on a diatom、uh, plate. Then gene is introduced, introduced in this way. And also, Uh, the atom cells can accept the、uh, electro operation system、uh, to be competent for, for the gene introduction. And that way, we could do the,、uh, this kind of GFP tagging localization of proteins. For instance, this is the theta type carbon carbohydrates in the thyroid pen、uh, pyrenoid penetrating thyroid membrane that we discovered, first we discovered the theta type carbon carbohydrates. This is the acaporin, which is the water channel and CO2 channel. Uh, that is、uh, specifically localized in the, that one is specifically localized in the vacuole of the atom cells. And this is the SEC4,、uh, one of the SEC4 proteins that is localized in, at the、uh, plasma membrane. That, that, that can, the kind of experiment could be done, but we couldn't really knock it out. But also, this century, we succeeded to utilize the、uh, bacterial conjugation system. Bacteria have some、uh, instinct, <laughs> instinct or capacity、uh, to introduce their plasmid into other bacteria or other organisms to transmit their gene information. So,、uh, using this system of bacterial transmitting thing, Transmitting episome, episome means plasmid.、Uh, we just mix this E. coli, which carries this、uh, plasmid、uh, with the、uh, diatom cells like that. Then bacteria can spike、uh, these cells with their conjugation system and transmit their plasmid into these diatoms. And we can easily、uh, transform the diatom cells with this system. This is a very recent system discovered in 2015, and it's quite successful. So, in, in, and then, you know, the plasmid introduced into the atom is、uh, stably maintained by a system that is used、uh, in、uh, yeast cells. East cells has also a plasmid, and that, that, that East plasmid is、uh, maintained by their、uh, own, you know, replicon maintaining system.、Uh, then 
that system was quite efficient, efficiently worked in the diatom episome keeping system. So in this way, for instance, if we do any, uh, if we, you know, put any uh, required gene of interest here, we can put this plasmid into diatom cells by bacteria, and then diatom keeps this plasmid uh, into, in, in the diatom cells. And we can, you know, drive the, uh, any uh, gene expression system from this plasmid. It's quite a convenient system now we can use. And also uh, gene silencing system like RNA interferences also uh, operational. Gene silencing system is firstly, uh, uh, RNAi system is firstly discovered in uh, nematode. Uh, then it is comprised of the, uh, um, you know, dicer, dicer cutting of the loop uh, RNA, which is called shRNA, and then this fragment is incorporated in the Argonaut system, which is called the AGO system. Then uh, Argonaut system uh, destroy the uh, uh, messenger RNA, which has the same sequence as this shRNA. In that way, uh, we can destroy the uh, um, we can destroy experimentally the uh, the certain uh, sequence messenger RNA. Uh, then that me messenger RNA can make much protein uh, as compared to the wild type cells. The one of the uh, example that I that we made in our laboratory is this one. Um, we just uh, made the uh, shRNA type uh, stem loop RNA construct, which encodes the part sequence of Phaeodactylum trichonutum UMP synthase. That is a uh, reaction uh, responsible here. Um, when we make that uracil, which is a part of the uh, uh, you know uh, nucleotide uh, for RNA, that first orotate will be converted into orotidine five phosphate and then converted into five prime UMP and then it gonna go to uridine and eventually uh, synthesized as a uracil. But then most uh, eukaryotic cells has uh, two um, step uh, enzyme in one polypeptide that is called UMP synthase that in in one by one enzyme protein all of that can be converted into five prime UMP. Uh, this enzyme has a two uh, active site. Then if if we uh, uh, add five FOA which is the analog of all of that, this metabolic system can produce the five fluorouracil which is extremely toxic compound for the uh, eukaryotic cells. And then the cells operating full, uh, operating this metabolic system cannot survive on 5FOA uh, because they produce uh, 5 full uracil. But if we destroy a part of this metabolic system, then that cell can survive on 5-FOA because they cannot make the 5 uh, floor uracil. But instead, they require uracil from the outside of the cells, right? So I we just uh, knock down the this enzyme in the phaeodactyl trichlinitum, which is a uh, which is diatom, um, by RNAi. So RNAi knockout, knock, knock down, makes the uh, this PTMPS uh, X, X protein level really lower as compared to the wild type cells. And the phenotype is completely flipped. Wild type cells, as I explained, cannot grow on 5-FOA. 5-FOA addition. This is not adding, right? Wild type cells only grows on nothing. But uh, this RNAi mutant 
can only grow on the five alkali mutant with uracil. But if we remove the uracil from the seawater, then this mutant cannot grow in that uh, system. So in that in that way, we can you know find out that uh, RNA is uh, operational uh, system experimentally in uh, uh, the atom cells. So also recent uh, progress is that we can do the uh, a, a specific knockout of the genomic sequence by several techniques. That is a technique called a transcript acti activator like effector nucleus that is called talent. That, that, that's actually uh, not really uh, used these, these days. But anyway, in briefly, uh, there is a amino acid sequence which can uh, specifically recognize the specific gene sequences. We can construct a kind of amino acid uh, variations. And then uh, these amino acids, uh, the, the gene encoding such kind of amino acid sequence that, that, that can recognize a specific gene sequence is designed for the design to sandwich the gene of, of interest that we want to cut. Then, you know, put the uh, DNA uh, cutting enzyme gene to each construct. Then, you know, make the, the, those kind of gene expressed in the diatom cells. And then that, that, that product will bind to the specific gene sequence, the genomic sequence. And then this genomic sequence makes the dimer of FOC1 uh, DNA nucleus. And, and that Fokan dimer can cut this part of the uh, DNA, uh, double strand DNA, like this. Then the double strand cut would uh, make a homologous end joint, uh, homologous recombination repair, and also non homologous end joint. Then, if the, once the non homologous end joining occurs, uh, that uh, repaired site will sometimes lose the uh, nucleotide and sometimes uh, have an additional uh, not wild type nucleotide sequence that is called indel. In that way, we can make a mutation of the desired uh, place by this Tarim method. But this uh, Tarim method is quite uh, difficult to make this. A complicated, uh, uh, you know, DNA binding protein sequence. Then now recently, uh, CRISPR uh, associated protein nine uh, system that is CRISPR Cas9 system is very commonly used. Actually, this CRISPR Cas9 uh, system uh, thing is uh, actually uh, got won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, right? Then the, the CRISPR Cas9 system is more, much more simpler. Uh, CRISPR sequence, uh, CRISPR sequence makes the uh, guide RNA. That if the if if we set the guide RNA sequence to target certain desired genomic sequence, then uh, this guide RNA goes to the um, genome uh, specific genome sequences. Then uh, guide RNA bound genome sequence is a target of a DNA uh, cutting enzyme called Cas9. Then DNA cutting enzyme called Cas9 can recognize this, uh, you know, guide RNA sequence and then cut the uh, DNA sequence at both sides of the nucle uh, nucleotide sequence, both sides of the, the DNA do uh, double helixes. Then by this cutting, also uh, the same, you know, non homologous, non homologous end joining uh, will happen in this part, uh, which can introduce uh, insertion or deletion of the nucleotide, which makes the uh, mutation uh, of the uh, certain gene sequence of desired uh, of desired by for the for the experiment. Um, and this is actually uh, originally a. a Bacterial defense system for the uh, against the uh, 
viral, virus infection. Once, bac once bacteria was get uh, infected by virus, bacteria keep that virus the virus DNA sequence into the into ba bacterial genome, and when uh, they get infected again with uh, by the same virus, then they make the uh, guide RNA from the uh, previous uh, virus infection that 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 they they keep the they keep the previous bacterial infection that is called CRISPR sequence, and then uh, this uh, guide RNA made from their you know uh, previous infection uh, just the uh, attack the uh, virus uh, DNA sequence and then a bacterial Cas9 protein will, can cut the uh, virus DNA. That, that is originally uh, works in a natural environment, but now we can use that same system uh, for the experiment to destroy the uh, desired DNA sequence in on our genome. Uh, we use quite a lot for uh, quite a lot uh, of the, the, the system for many experiments now. And also by using this kind of uh, gene transformation technology, we can make the uh, more efficient uh, industrially usable algal cells. For instance, this is a diatom which can accumulate very high amount of oil, then we can make this kind of uh, algal field to make an oil or algal culturing system to make an oil. The kind of uh, project is going on uh, all over the world now. And also, uh, as I told before, the atom is covered by a cell wall with a very finely fabricated uh, um, silicate. So this size, this uh, size bar is 500 nanometer, and this smallest size is several 10 nanometer, right? Then the atoms can make this kind of uh, very finely fabricated silica, silica structure uh, by self-organization. So that is a sort of a very uh, usable structure that uh, if we can control this kind of system. For instance, when we make the uh, semiconductor, there is a two method. One is uh, uh, fabricating the semiconductor uh, um, by a, uh, uh, by, uh, how to say, um, etching. By etching from the from the uh, big material, it's a top-down technology. Then this, uh, you know, uh, how to say a um, semiconductor fabrication uh, by a uh, etching uh, requires the uh, light shading to make a design of the the, the semiconductor surface. So it is restricted by the um, uh, light wavelengths, which is 380 to 770, which is visible light. So probably by top-down system, we can make slightly below the uh, sizes, like 100 nanometer or something. But to make Mesoscopic scale, which is a diatom and the virus scale, 10 to 100 nanometer scale of the fabrication is quite difficult and very expensive. And also, we can uh, pile up the uh, molecule from the, from the bottom. But to make the uh, bottom up technology by, by piling up the, each uh, atoms uh, by probe, right? Pin, by molecular pinset, uh, still. Uh, we need a lot of cost to make a 10 to 100 nanometer mesoscopic scale. So the kind of, uh, for that kind of things, uh, biological, uh, very fine uh, structuring system, self-organizing system of the very fine structure is, is uh, attracting the um, interest. So the atom is one of those.
And okay, um, when Datum makes the uh, silica uh, biomineralization outside of the cells, this is a structure that, that is probed by the fluorescent materials. This is one of the datum called cylinder fusiformis. They have such kind of very extremely uh, uh, polarized uh, peptide within this shell. That is called shirafin. It's highly uh, phosphorylated at one side, but highly uh, um, polyaminated, which is highly positively charged, negative charged and positive charged, very extreme polypeptide. And if we isolate this protein from the uh, diatoms and mix with the silicate in a test tube, they can make instantaneously this kind of the uh, fairly uh, spherical uh, 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 balls within the cell. So that is three micrometers. So the average size is 500 micrometer. This is three micron and average size of this ball is 500 micrometer. So still quite big, but we can somehow control the, uh, uh, you know, this kind of silica nanofabrication uh, by our hand. And also um, we can, you know, we can actually, Get that gene that is go that is uh, sorted to the um, silica sh silica shell of the uh, diatoms, and then we can put the uh, gene of interest underneath that uh, silica shell sorting genes like a siapin, and then transform the diatom cells with these uh, uh, genes. Then we can successfully uh, display the GFP uh, protein onto the diatom uh, silica cell or diatom flusters. So this is a sort of, of enzyme immobilization technology that we can you know, immobilize the uh, enzyme onto the diatom cells. And then, then diatom cells can, can grow only with the seawater and the light, right? So it is quite inexpensive system if once it is established, and then this diatom cells displaying some enzyme can be used repeatedly uh, to do some uh, important reactions, industrially important reactions. So I can I can let me summarize the final uh, uh, part. So. <clears throat> A uh, usable life cycle of datum is normally deployed at stage to end. So it is not useful for gene knockout technique. It used to be. But datum accepts several gene insertion protocol and randomly integrated exogenous DNA into their genome. Also, recent progress in enable the stable maintenance of plastid in datum cells. These are powerful tools for molecular study of datum. Recent cutting edge genome editing technologies are all applicable to datums, greatly expanding the possibility of datum study at molecular basis. Datums uh, photosynthesis product is oil, not starch. So it is considered to be alternative fuel, which does not compete to food. Silica share formation has been a attracting an addictive interest from material science as a candidate for nanofabrication and enzyme immobilization technologies. Okay, um, okay, uh, my lecture is that's it. And then I want to show the subject for the group work uh, for this afternoon. Okay, first, uh, Subject is list, please list at least three aspects that are expected to occur in ocean and land in the future as a result of the increased CO2 and ocean acidification. Then for each three aspects, please show a uh, scientific reason. And also please list the expected impact of increase in CO2 and ocean acidification on human society.
just you need to search uh, the literature and the web for this, I think. But anyway, uh, ba based partially upon the uh, of my lecture, please uh, expand your, uh, uh, you know, uh, discussion to the future environment and future society of the impact of CO2. Also, uh, for this, please, please show the scientific reasoning that is rational, right? Okay. Uh, hi. Bimin-san. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So I think the subject, I think we still keep like this. Uh, okay, and I want to also uh, take a question if there is any. So any question from the student? <laughs> Okay, student. Yeah. If there's no question, then I want to leave you guys to work on this subject. Okay, please. Any question? So we, I have to be back at three o'clock, maybe. Yes. Uh. How many groups? There will be three groups inside. Three, three groups, okay. Yeah, I already prepare uh the breakout room. So maybe yeah. now we are going to have for uh to have a rest. Um we will have a rest uh, one hour and then student please uh, you join later on, one hour later on, and please you please uh join and directly you enter to the room. I already prepare, yeah. So uh, I think so. No, before uh, Matsuda Sensei leave, uh, uh, please, if you would like to ask before he leaves, uh, concerning the uh, just now the topic. Any question? Yeah, if if there's no no question, then then you know, just okay. have uh, uh, lunch lunch and yeah. So it's time. For uh, break and lunch, yeah. so we uh, uh please join again one hour later on uh, around uh what do you think Tosense around okay, so one thirty yes one thirty one thirty please uh, join one thirty and uh directly you enter the room and later on maybe uh Matsuda Sensei and Tosense and me also will check uh you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, at the streaming, I already understand about this one. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you one hour later on. Uh, I mean, one thirty. Sorry, one thirty. Uh, it is, uh, Japan times or twelve thirty. Uh, Bali times. Thank you very much. Bibi sa. Hello, Efren Batunangar. You can join directly to the break room. Okay, thank you. Okay, CO2 increase. The here, uh, uh, so it is well known. So climate change. So atmospheric carbon dioxide. Dioxide, now more than so one of the effects of the uh, increase of the CO2 is uh, uh, the increase of the temperature, I think. And you can find other aspects So uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> from the web. So climate change or CO2 increase of carbon dioxide by the sign. Greenhouse gas emission. Okay, this one. The in the atoms are increasing. Global warming. So global warming. It is a keyword. One of the keyword. And uh, sudah dimulai. Sudah. Okay. Uh.
Coba buka kanvanya dulu. Yang mana kan kanvanya ini kita? Itu yang dipikir dikirim desa bagus. Oh ya. Oh, oh, yang di, oh, iya, 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 i
Ya, oh di di mana di uh, breakout room normal nggak bisa ini ya speakernya ya. Oke, okay, nggak apa-apa. Hmm. Itu saya broad, broadcast sudah bisa kedengaran ya? Sudah Pak, udah kelihatan tadi. Ya udah ya. Supaya yang grup lain hmm. bisa baca juga. Ya relatif lah 30 menit. Soalnya ada yang tiga kalian enak empat orang yang grup mana ini? Di room 2 cuma dua orang coba. Mungkin dia hemat sudah sensei akses to room number one. Uh, sensei, so now uh, they are in preparation. Oke, okay. masih sudah sensei already left. And come to room two. Nanti <laughs> paling dua orang, jauh 30 menit. Berarti 10 menit, 10 menit aja. Berarti 10 menit. Bening. This is... Bibing. So, uh... Andriana Sensei, Hi. Um, we missed some your message. Yes. So please repeat. repeat. Okay. Uh, I already broadcast the message that we are going to have presentation. Uh, for presentation is 30 minutes and 15 minutes for discussion. But I think today you just have to uh, participants, yeah? So maybe, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, maybe seven minutes, seven minutes, something like that. Uh, just because the other group, they have uh, five uh, students. So at least 30 minutes divided by five is six minutes, six minutes, something like that. So you can arrange your time. Maybe we, we can understand it in your case because you no, know, you just two students left. Yeah, this is the remaining. So I think, uh, yeah, you just introduce about, uh, uh, just know about CO2, uh, decreasing of CO2, and, uh, and then, yeah, there's two topic, yeah. So at least one, maybe number one is Chosang, for example. Number two is Riri Kokoderasang, for example, something like that. Seven minutes, seven minutes, yeah. We, we understand with the situation, but maybe the other student, maybe I will... Uh, what do you think, Matsuda Sensei? Because just now one student, uh, think she she written to Myanmar, but she would like to uh, actually would like to uh, participate uh, with your uh, lecture. So I think we request to her prepare something maybe. Huh? One student name is Teng. I forget the moment. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Song. Yes, thank you, Song. Thank you, Song. Now return back to Myanmar. So, so she, uh, well, return back to Myanmar and doesn't have access to Zoom. Yes. Uh, yeah, but uh, I will send uh, YouTube about your lecture. So what kind of the task that she must prepare? Uh, maybe uh, some video? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, you know. Is, it, is it required? Yeah, because... Just it's, it's abstract. This is okay, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for final. Because we are going to give a grade. Because he, he, will, he, will, he will attend to other lecture, right? Yeah, yeah, he will attend the other. Well, it should uh, be okay then. Okay. Yeah. So unfortunately, I don't know actually why. If you cannot enough mark, I'm going to think about it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, Sensei, thank you very much. So please, Chiji uh, Zhang, eh, Cho Sang, and Ririko, just now, uh, Toh Sensei already. Who yeah, is, already. Who is absent today? <laughs> For KGU student. <laughs> Uh, no three student. Kawahara. Yes. Uh, Kawahara. Kawahara. Yuto Kawahara. Uh, didn't. Uh, you sang. And but who who are the? Rui Q U in okay. the first. All from group two. Yeah, oh, yeah, group two. And all other came. Other came right. Yeah. Rui Q U sang. Uh, attend in the first lecture, but in the second lecture, uh, of you, 
he uh, he I think men I think he left. Who else was wasn't here today? Yuto Kawahara. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yuto and uh, Ted Yun Sang and Q U I marked, and then yeah. who other? Maybe Group One Sensei. Who is it? Wait, <laughs> I must check because. Okay. Wait. You better check, check now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, no problem, Sensei. I will, I will, I will confirm again. Yeah. There's some a couple students didn't come, right? Yeah, but group three, all students are, are come. Well, it was there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hello, group one. Yes, but uh sa, yang gak akan yang gak hadir ini, ini satu orang siapa? Uh, dia. Dia bakal ikut enggak nih? Presentasi ini, uh, kayaknya enggak, Pak. Tapi dia udah, dia juga bantu presentasi kita sih, Pak. Uh, uh, tapi presentasinya butuh dia bicara nih. Gimana nih? Soalnya ditanya sama uh, Matsuda Sensei barusan. Sebentar, saya tanya dia dulu ya, Pak. Iya, yeah, iya, yeah. saya kalau grup tiga sudah semuanya coba dianya nanti minimal uh, omong, dia ucapkan terus kemudian dia tinggal mungkin masih. Bisa ini Kenapa dia ada apa? Kurang tahu pak Tapi hmm. tadi dia udah bilang katanya udah izin ke Bu Pebri Oh coba saya ke kontak Bu Pebri ya Terus sambil saya tunggu uh, informasi Sebelum saya telepon ke Mas Sudah CC Karena dia mau beri nilai langsung Misalnya dia mau beres hari ini Karena besok dia harus berangkat lagi ke tempat lain Uh, dia bisa pak katanya oh Dan bisa kan? ya ya udah kalau ya. itu saya confirm ke oke okay. so saya I will uh, hello Mat sudah sensei ya so in the group four a eh, group one all audience uh, can uh, attend in the final presentation but no one student because of something he she prepare and then she help them but uh, she will join later on in the final presentation So, so so it's it's a ni ni putu. Yeah, ni putu. Ni putu was. Yeah. Si, ni putu actually. Oh, the lecture. Yeah, but just now left just for a moment and then let them back again. Okay, okay. Okay, so no problem. Group one and group three is okay. Yeah. All student take participate participation. Yeah. Okay, no problem, Sis. Hey. Nah, Yustika. Apa nama share screen-nya hilang lagi, Kak? Hmm? Enggak, Pak. Ini ya, tadi mau share screen presentasinya, tapi tadi hilang lagi. <laughs> oh, iya, iya. Silahkan aja share, Pak. Oh. Oke. Okay. Uh, I think, Tau Sensei, will you open or? Oke, okay, I think time is... Uh, it's already 15.42, so I think I'm going to open this one. Uh, well, uh, we, we, can we start to have some presentation from one or from group one? Group yeah, yeah, please go ahead. I think, uh, I hope uh, in this case, maybe can we start? Uh, from group uh three because group two I think just two student or maybe group one who will be the first or group Eta Astrinita group group three three so okay okay so maybe group three will start and say so maybe uh no uh wait a moment I will check first okay I already you can share. Okay, start. Uh, you will have a uh, thirty minutes for presentation, and fifteen minutes for discussion. Okay, so the time is for you now. Start. Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so here, uh, we are from uh, group three. Uh, we will deliver our result. Uh, from our discussions with the title Aspects that happen to environment and humans if carbon dioxide increases and oceans acidify. Next. 
And uh, here are the member of uh, group three. The first is Abdul Haris Wicaksono. Uh, the second is Efrem Batunanggar, Tari Kosya, Desa Amadi Prabayu Diantari, and also Nimade Eta Astrinita. Next. Uh, okay, the first is uh, increased uh, carbon dioxide. An increase in carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere can cause an increase in temperature at the Earth's surface. Uh, the first impact is inland. Uh, there will be happen in uh, global warming and also uh, the loss of glaciers. Uh, and the second is in the oceans. Uh, the acidity of seawater will increase. Next. Uh, increased uh, acidified oceans. Ocean acidification is a term that describes the process by which various human activities increase the absorption of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, thereby causing a decrease in the pH level of seawater. Sea uh, the main cause of increasing ocean acidity is human activity. The increasing in human activity cannot be separated from the dis Fossil of anthropogenic waste, Yakin and Kabanga, 2015. Uh, and one impact from acidified ocean is uh, the marine life uh, is threatened. Next. Okay, next is ocean modification will be will be a driver for a substantial change. The first one is the problem with ocean edification is the sustained nature of the change as the risk come from the lifetime exposure to lower pH levels. The rapid pace of edification will be influenced the extent to which calcifying organism will be able to adapt. A more acidic environment will harm other marine species such as mollusks, corals, and some varieties of plankton. Marine organisms could also experience changes in growth, development, abundance, and survival in response to ocean edification. Next. Okay, can you see the picture? The picture of one a mollusk cell dissolves under acidic condition. The cell almost completely dissolves after 45 days when placed in sweat sweater with pH and carbonate level project by models for the year 2000. 2100. Can you see day by uh, day by day, a mollusk cell dissolve under acidic condition. And the, the second picture is a summary of effect of ocean edification among K taxonomies group. The main response are re uh, represent in present chains, which could be either positive or green. And the second one is negative or red. Can you see the algae is uh, the, the either positive. Why? Because the impact of ocean edification are not uniform across all species. Some algae and seagrass may benefit, benefit from higher CO2 concentration in the ocean, as they might increase the photosynthesis and growth rates. There's somebody talking? Maybe it is muted. Okay. Uh, for tomorrow, it still has impact on marine environment. The first one, coral reefs are biologist communities in shallow marine, shallow marine waters that generally develop optimally at water temperatures of 25 to 29 degrees Celsius and are very vulnerable to change in water temperatures, temperature, which is one of the factors controlling coral growth and, develop, and development. So that an increase in temperature of just one degree Celsius, coral, polyp, coral polyps experience severe stress and if it lasts for a long time, three, four, six, six months, will cause the release of the Osantella algae in the body of coral and in the body of coral animals, where this even is called coral, coral washing or bleaching. Second two, phytoplankton. The description, the description of water quality will cause the absence of phytoplankton as primary production in the food chains. According to Shamsuddin 2000, 2000, the depletion of the ozone layer has a adversely 
affect the community of phytoplankton community in the ocean due to increase GHG emission in the form of GFC, GFC. And the second and the third, marine biota. The destruction of coral ecosystem and the decline in the number of phytoplankton population will threaten the life of marine biota because their living space is damaged and their food source are disgracing. Okay, next to impact of increasing ocean acidification on human society. In the increasing of carbon dioxide doesn't, doesn't only impact to acidification of the ocean as, as it also impacts the, ma the marine, marine life and also dry land, especially human life. There, there are several expect impact to human life by increasing of ocean edification in, in the future, decreasing of oxygen supply, famine, and people, people's health. First, impact of increasing ocean acidification on human society is decreasing of oxygen supply. Oxygen holds a very important role in human's life as we need oxygen for life. Oxygen came from the result of photosynthesis of plants and also phytoplankton. Oxygen came a lot from the rainforest that several countries have in tropical areas such as Brazil, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, and many more. But based on what scientists have researched, up to 50 to 80 percent of oxygen was produced by phytoplankton. Phytoplankton produce oxygen when they was put to the surface to get sunlight for them, but the increasing number of ocean acidification have impacted the phytoplankton physiology. Researchers found that phytoplankton in Antarctica power was reduced to make a strong wall and have a smaller body to store the carbon dioxide. Next. Uh, the second impact of increasing ocean, ocean acidification on human society is famine and stunting. Uh, as we know, protein was very important, especially for grown-up age, as it's not only provide energy, but it also provides cell structure, especially mus muscle. That is how that fish provide 17% of world's meat consumption, and for coastal communities, their are line was almost 70%. Ocean acidification was a fatal death for fish as it removes calcite and the making of skeleton and cells. Currently, there are about 149 million child at below 5 years experiencing stunting well. 68% of them was in Asia. Next. Okay. Uh... This slide uh, uh, held uh, almost 15% uh, people in Africa relate to marine catch and before reset so how fish, shrimp, crabs, and cones were turned by the ocean acid as it slowly destroyed their cell and cell And humans got the impacts also by the death of this marine life. The ocean acid also kill the egg and larva of the animals, so there will be a significant loss of fisheries and it will be impact the elder. For the example, stunting and also the ocean acid will be will also be dangerous to consume or drink. For example, to dry, as country get their water to drink from the sea, it will not be good. From a uh, for human body and also for human respiration, people people also rely on marine for the making of cancer medicines from coral and the effect of the ocean acid has breached the coral, so it was not sustainable for the making of the medicines. Next. Okay, the next slide. Uh, impact of in uh, in carbon 
Oxida on Human Society. Change in marine ecosystem will be health consequential for human society, which the dependent on the goods and services this ecosystem provide. The implication for society con because substantial revenue, the revenue delays loss of employment and livelihood, and other indirect economicals. Next is health effects. This may include headache, dizziness, restlessness, a tingling or pains or needless feeling, difficulty breathing, sweating, tiredness, increased heart rate, elevated blood pressure, coma, asphyxia, and convulsions. Okay, for coastal protection. Marine ecosystems such as coral reefs protect short, short lines from the descriptive action from storm surges and cyclones. Sheltering on sheltering the only habitat habitable land for several islands nationals island nation. This protective function of reef prevent loss of life, property damage, and erosion. And has been valued at nine billion US dollar per year. Um, tourism. This industry could be definitely uh, affected by the impacts of the ocean acidification on marine ecosystem. Uh. In Australia, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park interests about one, one million visits each year and gets more fifteen four billion to the Australia economy. And next, the carbon storage and climate regulation. The capacity of the ocean to absorb carbon dioxide discretion as ocean activation interests more acidic uh, ocean are less activity in the the rating climate change okay i think that's enough from us uh thank you very much for your participations and is there any question Could you go back to the second or third slide? Ah, uh, that's probably this one. Next, next. Okay. Ocean acidification is a term that describes the process by which various human activities increase the absorption of carbon dioxide absorption of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which means various human activities increase, uh, activities decrease the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, right? This means, this sentence means, isn't it? Various human activities Increase the absorption of carbon dioxide. Human activity increased the absorption, right? If the absorption was increased, then carbon dioxide will decrease from the atmosphere. Is that what you mean? Yes, sir. The carbon dioxide concentration decreases according to the human activities. Is it? <laughs> Is it true? <laughs> it is wrong, right? The pro 
by which various human activities increase the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, isn't it? This is the correct word, is correct sentence, isn't it? Various human activities increases increase the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Do you understand? Group three. Human activity does not increase the absorption. Human activities simply increase the concentration of carbon dioxide. That's what I, I think. Agree? <laughs> yes, agree, sir. Agree. <laughs> agree? Yes. Okay, then thereby causing a decrease in the pH level of CO2. Why pH decrease by the increase of CO2? Please give a rationale for that. Why increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere change, uh, decrease the pH of seawater? Does anyone can answer? Wait a minute, sir. We will uh, discuss uh, first. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, yeah, okay, please, uh, you know, think this reason is okay. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, Bibin Sensei. Hi. Yeah, could you please uh, proceed? Because, you know, we don't have to wait answer because, you know, they, they, they can just uh, think about it. So that's okay. fine. Okay. Yeah, any so, could you take any, any more question? Uh -huh. Any argument from the uh group uh three? So or maybe any question from the other group? Group one or group two, will you ask? Uh maybe I will try to answer. Okay. Uh, what, the, what's your name? What is your name? My name is Tariko Shia. Tariko. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the decreasing of the pH, uh, this, uh, the concentrations of pH, uh, is, uh, affected. Uh, by carbon dioxide or uh, between carbon dioxide and the pH has a connection uh, and when the when carbon dioxide increase in the water so it means the oxygen is low uh, and it uh, make the uh, ion hydrogen the concentrations of ion hydrogen uh, increase and the pH uh, will decrease and be acid. Maybe that's... Hmm. Oh, uh, if, if more CO2 dissolved, then the CO2 will uh, bind with water, which produces proton, right? Which is why pH of the seawater will be decreased uh, by the increase increment of the CO2. It's just a matter of the uh, equilibrium of carbon dioxide and bicarbonate and proton. Okay. <laughs> and then, okay, then I'll ask one more thing. Yes. If, um, in some part of the slide, somebody said that um, uh, shellfish, shellfish will will be really affected by ocean acidification. Could you please explain the uh, reason for that? Why shellfish will be really affected by ocean acidification? Yeah, yeah. This one. What is the reason? 
that shellfish is affected. Wait a minute, sir. No. Okay, that's okay. Um. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh Bibi san Yes. Please proceed. Yeah. Uh, how? Group three. Will you answer? Because just now you just try to find out the. You still discuss with the, your friend. Oh no, uh, for Justin, because you are group uh, one. Yes, yeah, so please group three. Please. Uh, uh, maybe. Uh, why? Uh, why a mole cell? Um, uh, because uh, they will difficult to make a cell because uh, they can uh, they cannot survive. <clears throat> To protect them uh, themselves because uh, the the edification edification across yeah okay yeah probably it is also the matter of the uh, changes in the equilibrium of the calcium carbonate formation right maybe calcium carbonate can dissolve rather than formed uh, and under the uh, lower pH. Oh, you are you from uh, is somebody <laughs> answering? Justin is answering. Yeah, yeah, group one would like to answer this, okay? Uh, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, please, uh, Justin, if you have some idea. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, I will try to answer. Uh, about question from Sensei Yusuke Matsuda. Uh, the reason is uh, ocean acidification reduces the availability of carbonate ions, uh, which are essential for calcifying organisms such as oyster, crabs, and others. So uh, as a result, these species may experience difficulty in shell and skeleton formation and that thing is leading to a weaker and more vulnerable structures. So this can have cascading effects in the future on marine ecosystem, as these organisms play crucial, crucial roles in the food web and provide habitats and food sources for other species too. Maybe that's my answer, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The Bibi said it's already 30 minutes, so please pr proceed. Okay. So I think uh I think uh it's enough I think for group one eh, for group three we are going to shift to the other group maybe group one uh you can start thank you for group three yeah group one please make some preparation for present okay. okay. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are from Group 1, and today we will be presenting our result of our discussion about the test that given by Sensei Yusuke Masuda. But before that, let me introduce our group. Next slide, please. First off, we have uh, Yustika from Aquatic Resource Management. Next, we have Nurma from Aquatic Resource Management. Next, we have myself, Justin, from Aquatic Resource Management. Next, we have Benin from Aquatic Resource Management, and lastly, Dia from Marine and Marine Science major, and we are all students of Udayana University. Next, please. The first question is, what aspects that are expected to occur in the ocean and on land in the future as a result of increased carbon dioxide and acidified ocean? The first aspect that I take is a disruption of calcifying organism. For more than 200 years or since the Industrial Revolution, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased due to the burn, burning of fossil, fossil fuels and land use chains. The ocean absorbs about 30 percent. Um, uh, before that, uh, the slide. OK, I'm sorry. Uh, I continue. 
uh, the ocean absorbs about 30% of the carbon dioxide that is released in the atmosphere. And as level of atmospheric carbon dioxide increase, so do the levels in the ocean. When the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide is absorbed by seawater, a series of chemical reactions occur resulting in the increased concentration of hydrogen ion. This increase causes the seawater to become more acidic and causes carbonate ion to be relatively less abundant. So uh, ocean acidification reduces the availability of carbonate ions, which are essential for classifying organisms such as oyster, grabs, sea urchin, lobsters, and coral to build and maintain their shells and skeletons, as I said before. As a result, this organism, this species may experience difficulty in cell and skeleton formation, leading to a weaker and more vulnerable structure. So this issue can have cascading effects on the future on marine ecosystem, as these organisms play crucial roles in the food web and provide habitat food sources for other species. And the scientific rationale for this aspect is the, as I said before, the reduction in carbonate ions due to the ocean acidification has been observed and documented leading to challenges for calcifying organism in shell and skeleton formation in the future. Thank you. And next, the second aspect will be presented by Ka Yustika. Okay, thank you for your time. Uh, I'll uh, read for the point two, okay? Uh, the point two is the altered behavior and the physiology. Yeah, uh, ocean ocean acidification can affect the behavior and physiology of marine organisms. For the example, certain fish may experience this created ability to detect predators in the more acidy waters. This can disrupt the balance of the predator prey interaction and impact the interite food web. Additionally, it's defeat it's Acidified waters can affect the sensory abilities, growth, and reproduction of the various marine species. Okay, next, the point three. Okay, thank you. So the last aspect that are expected to occur in the ocean and on land in the future as a result of increased carbon dioxide and acidified ocean is a loss of biodiversity. So the combination of increased carbon dioxide and acidified ocean can lead to the loss of marine biodiversity. Some species may be more resilient to this change, while others may struggle to adapt. This can result in shifts in species composition and abundance, potentially leading to the decline of certain species and the proliferation of others. The decline the loss of biodiversity can have far-reaching uh, consequences for me. the functioning excuse and me. excuse yes. me um, hello hello uh i think the powerpoint doesn't change is it some trouble it's like the first slide in... is always sticking is it is it okay right, sir. you explain a lot but the slide still similar with so in Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I just um, is it okay? Some if it is yeah, okay, okay, it's okay. 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 It's okay. 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 Continue. Okay. I I I always finish the loss of biodiversity can oh, have no, for reaching for the functioning and resilience of marine ecosystem. Thank you. Okay. The second one is the impact of increases in carbon dioxide and ocean acidification on human society. Uh, for before, our, our PowerPoint is designed to show only the important points of our discussion. So the rest of the explanation will be explained by us uh, this way. So the one of the impact caused by ocean acidification on human society is on tourism. The declining of coral reefs uh, will reduce the attractiveness of a coastal area as a tourism destination. The ocean acidification uh, affects coral reefs the most, which are the important tourist attractions. But these coral reefs are particularly vulnerable to the effects of ocean acidification, as the uh, reduce, reducing in attractiveness of a coastal area uh getting oh, I'm sorry the attractiveness point of 
one coastal area getting lower, thus the number of visitors will be lower, and that leads to reduced incomes for the local communities, and that will be negatively impact these communities as well. And the second point will be explained by my, by my friend. Okay, thank you, Bening. I will continue. So the second impact is the human uh, health impacts that the impacts of ocean acidification on human health are not yet fully understood. But there is evidence to suggest that it could have negative effects. For example, the consumption of shellfish that have been impacted by ocean acidification may pose health risks to humans. Additionally, the loss of marine biodiversity can impact the availability of these stocks, potentially affecting the diets of communities that rely on seaboats as a primary source of protein. Thank you. Okay, I will continue of the economic impact. The economic impact of ocean edification are likely to be significant. The loss of fisheries and aquaculture industry, as well as the decline in tourism, can have far-reaching consequences for the economic of coastal communities. Additionally, the cost of adapting to and mitigating the effects of the of ocean acidification can be substantial. Scientific rationale for its impact is the decline in selfish population due to ocean acidification has been observed and documented, leading to challenges for communities that rely on selfish har harvesting and farming. Cor coral reefs are are known to be vulnerable to the effects of ocean edification and the decline of this ecosystem can impact tourists, tourism in areas that are really on them. The post potential health risks associated with consuming selfish impact by ocean edification are a concern. The economic impact of ocean edification are complex and can vary depend on the region and industry. However, the loss of fisheries and aquaculture industries, as well as the decline in tourism, can have significant socioeconomic consequences for coastal communities. Overall, that the expected impacts of increased carbon dioxide and acidification ocean on human society are significant and far-reaching far -reaching it is important to address this challenge through mitigation effort and the development of sus sustainable practices to protect the health and resilience of our ocean and the communities that depends on them. This is the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for your interest and attention. Any question, anyone? Okay. So, uh group one already present uh, so please uh, if there's some question from group three or group uh, two and also maybe next from us hello group three will you ask something to group one or maybe group two can you show again uh, some slide group, group one all right. From the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we uh one slide before this one about the physiology. Yeah. This is you said that ocean acidification can affect the behavior and physiology of marine organism. And you said that one of the example of this one, certain fish may experience this ability to detect predator in more acid water. So uh, so it means the number of predators decrease and they will make some, what is it, the, the predator suffer, something like that. Or, uh, can you uh, explain this one more detail? And uh, what's the real thing of this one that maybe it's already happened? I think you already read from one reference. Would you like to explain more detail about this one? 
and also it's always happen in the deep uh deep sea or just i mean the close with the i don't know how to say uh maybe just uh less than uh, maybe until uh 100 meter the deep sea just 100 meter or it always happen in the deep sea so therefore i uh curious to and uh, to know about this one in the upper side or the surface or in the deep sea uh, all right sir uh we will discuss it in a minute please for one moment thank you if you explain something actually explain about this example that certain fish may experience decreased ability to detect predator in more acidic water the reason mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this always happen in the deep sea or or the whole sea i mean i mean like uh 200 meter or 100 meter deep or deep, deep uh, or maybe deep sea because hello justin maybe justin can <laughs> uh from the article or the web that i search it yeah. doesn't show what fish or what uh the depth of the ocean uh, yes. but but I think it's pelagic fish, pelagic oh, fish. Okay, okay, okay. So more deep, I would like to ask again. It is always happen in the the sea, in the close in the equator, or close to the core. I mean, close to the pole. I mean, not core pole. <laughs> it's like in the north part or the south part, or in the equator, or in sub sub temperate. Uh, this kind of the, uh, what is it? Uh, phenomena. I think because uh Matsuda Sese also already already explained yeah about the what is it biodiversity between the diatom and the other thing. So therefore, what do you think about this one? How about this one, Norma? Maybe Norma can answer. Norma sir. So I take the question. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you uh repetition? yes uh yeah because you said that uh ocean acidification can affect the behavior and physiology of marine organisms so uh uh i would like to ask that uh if we talk about the pole i mean in the equator area yeah uh the sea in the equator area and subtemperate and compare with the pole area so which one that it is have some high risk for this kind of the phenomena based on your uh, analysis? And of course, I think you already read maybe. And of course, maybe just now, uh, Matsuda Sese already explained about the uh, in equator or maybe in the subtemperate or maybe in the pole area. It's such kind of the uh phenomena uh will have some high risk maybe group three if you if we group three would like to answer this one so and it's lucky that there's still much to the say maybe you can clarify this your answer also maybe yeah we still have time any comment maybe i try to answer yes the question and Maybe the ocean, because which absorb a third of all of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, has grown more acidic because of fossil fuel use. I think that's yeah. So before the, my question the, is in the part of uh equator area in tropical something like in between mm -hmm. uh for example ten uh latitude ten degree or at the uh, north part and south part. Or maybe in the temperate area between twenty, uh, what is it between twenty two until, uh, forty, or maybe in the pole area, yeah, in uh, like in the north part or in south part. So therefore, uh, you have some argument of this one, or some information maybe when you read the reference of this one. Uh, we cannot say for sure, sir, because okay. the article and the web that we found yeah. says that 
it depends on the species, the ecosystem, and many various aspects. Okay, okay. So, uh, so it's depend on the biodiversity itself, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So maybe uh, that's from my side. So, um, Matsuda Sese, do you have some question or maybe uh, some it's idea? It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, move on. Yeah, we can move on to okay. the next group. Okay. Uh, any question from group three to group one? Or group two to group one? No, sir. Nothing, sir. There's nothing. Okay, uh, we still have uh, five minutes. Okay, so, okay. Uh, thank you for group one. So I think now we are going to shift and uh, to the group, the last group is group uh, two. So thank you very much for group one and group three. So please group two, would you like to prepare and start for your presentation? So, uh, Cho Sang and uh, Riri Kokodera, please, you can start. Or from group two, uh, there's just two students. So maybe it will not take that long time to present. Hello, Cho Sang, can you start? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, please. Hello, everyone. I, we are group two from Kansai Gakui University. If you speak, can you open with the slide style? Because very oh. small, this one. Okay. The slide, yeah. Uh, the big one. Uh, maybe the other one, not this one. I see. Okay, I see thank you. Yeah. What? Yes, thank you, this one. Okay, this one is okay. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So, it's uh, yeah, okay. Please go. How is this? Wait a minute, I, I have a trouble. <laughs> so, so. Okay. 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 Or share your share your screen. We will start presentation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This one. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, we are group two, and we will we are uh, we are going to presentation about how increasing CO two and acidification ocean affect us. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, one first aspect that are expected to occur in ocean and land in the future as a result of the increased CO2 and acid feed ocean is raising ocean level and warming. Uh, I'll explain the structure. First, carbon dioxide is greenhouse gas. A greenhouse is a structure designed designed to create a controlled environment for the cultivation of plants. It is typically made of transparent materials. For example, glass or plastic, uh, they dart a day allow sunlight to enter while trapping heat inside. This trap heat warms the interior of the greenhouse, uh, creating a microclimate that is warmer than the surrounding outdoor environment. Greenhouses are commonly used for various purposes. 
The concept of a greenhouse is also used uh, metaphorically in the context of Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere acts like a uh, natural greenhouse. And by this phenomen phenomenon, uh, the inside Ah, uh, no, sorry. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere acts like a natural greenhouse, allowing sunlight to enter, but trapping some of the heat that is radiated from the surface. And this phenomenon known as the greenhouse effect is essential for uh, may maintain maintaining temperatures on Earth that support our life. Uh, however, human activities have increased the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and it leads to an enhanced greenhouse effect and uh, global warming. And so, so carbon dioxide is causes global warming, and global warming melt Arctic and uh, Antarctic continent. So the huge amount of ice are melting now, and ocean level leads to rise. Uh, next slide, please. And global warming, of course, make ocean hotter. <clears throat> and uh, make uh, being ocean hotter, tidal current flow faster, <clears throat> and this wraps up vertical mixing of ocean layers. So, nutrients in ocean are scratching, and some species can't, uh, some species in, uh, some species can't get sufficient, sufficient nutrients. Next, please. The next aspect is coral leaf degradation. <laughs> the first coral leaves are consisted of calcium carbonate, the main component of coral structure is calcium carbonate, and using the energy obtained through photosynthesis, coral creates cal calcium ions and bicarbonate ions from seawater <laughs> and use them to build their carbonate st structure. And as acid dissolves calcium carbonate, so as acidification ocean degrees coral reef <clears throat> and coral reef is important for some creatures in ocean because uh, for example they they live by coral or in the coral leaf, or uh, some species used for shelter to dodge attack by other species. Uh, next, please. As we 
third aspect is oceanic oxygen depletion. The ocean aridification causes oceanic oxygen deplete, depletion because ocean has more carbon dioxide <coughs> and ocean has uh, no, oxygen depletion make dead zones. Dead zones zone is where marine life struggles to uh, survive due to the lack of sufficient oxygen. So as a result, creatures can't get sufficient oxygen and ecosystem will change. Uh, next please. Okay, uh, let's consider the expected impacts of increased carbon dioxide and ocean acidification on human society. I present three aspects regarding this issue. The first one is fisheries and food security. The second one is coastal protection and tourism. And the final is a carbon cycle and climate regulation. First, let's talk about the fisheries and the food society. Well, I think that ocean acidification and the changes in marine ecosystems can disrupt the fisheries fisheries and by affecting the growth and the survival of various marine species, including commercially important fish and shellfish. This can lead to reduce the fishery yields, impacting global food security and the living hoods, uh, livelihoods of community that rely on fishing. And the next one is coastal protection and the tourism. Coral reefs a coral reefs um, acts as natural, natural um, barriers that protect the uh, coastlines from erosion and uh, storm surge. This degradation due to ocean acidification and warming can dimin diminish their effectiveness in providing uh, coastal protection. Additionally, coral bleaching events can de de deter uh, tourists, affecting economics and that depend on Coastal tourism. Uh, uh, the next one is the carbon cycle and the climate regulation. Uh, the oceans play a significant role in re uh, in regulating the Earth's climate by uh, absorbing absorbing uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, however, as oceans uh, acidify, the ability to sequester carbon um, may be compressed, uh, comp promised. Com promised. Uh, yeah. This could uh, potentially uh, accurately climate change by allowing more carbon dioxide side to remain in the atmosphere, contributing to a positive feedback loop. Yeah, okay. Teacher, teacher, it's okay. Hello, finish? Yeah, it's finished. Okay, thank you very much, group two. So I will let uh, group one or group three, if you have some question or maybe some uh, input or I think question. <laughs> so please, group one or group three. I think uh, Chosam, please. So again, uh, the slide who know the group one and group three, I would like okay. to read. Yeah, please don't close. And Which? maybe Tosense or Amatsu Sense. Why why are ocean acidification decrease the oxygen? Or, or maybe re recall. Oh yeah, well, because uh, uh, there was uh, there are, uh, mm, there, 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 I uh, may, maybe my answer is not correct, but I think uh, it, uh the per percentage of ocean can have have uh, air is uh, so the ocean sea water can has has uh, Seota can't have uh, air freely, so uh, if sea water if sea water, uh, if sea water have a lot of carbon dioxide, it can can have more oxygen and uh, air, and so okay, climate change change causes a uh, change change exist ecosystem in ocean, so uh, species can uh, photosynthesis uh, the number of species can photosynthesis is decreasing yeah, this <laughs> this cartoon shows the ocean surface warming makes the uh, stratification of uh, ocean structure right this ocean stratification so ocean stratification means warmer water stays in the upper part and 
the colder water stays in the lower part, then the ocean loses mixing, particle mixing, and then oxygen is only exist in the upper part of the ocean. By losing the mixing, probably oxygen supply for the deep ocean just diminishes, and then it makes the dead zone deeper ocean, right? It actually really happens in the Japan Sea. Mm, yes. is, is that what you want, want to say, right? So it is not really a, relating to ocean acidification di directly. Rather, it is a, a result of a global warming. Global warming makes the uh, heaviness of the water different at the upper, upper part and the lower part, which inhibits the uh, particle mixing of o ocean water ocean water current. The mixing of ocean water current is very critical to supply oxygen into the uh, deeper ocean. That, 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 that's what you want to uh, imply, right? No. Uh, is that right? Yeah, what, what? Do you know what I mean? No. Uh, global warming makes the surface ocean warmer, right? Yeah. Hi. Then warmer water is lighter yes. in a heaviness. Hi. Weight specific weight it become lighter. Yeah. And then deeper water is cold, right? Hi. Yeah. The cold water is heavier. Yeah. Then upper water and lower water become layer stronger. Mm. Then it inhibits the particle mixing of water. Inhibit the particle mixing. Pateno mixing. So upper water is oxygen rich and lower water is oxygen poor. Oh, yeah. And but this should be mixed in a certain speed. Mm -hmm. This global warming the stratification of water calm inhibits the mixing mm -hmm. of upper water and the deeper water, okay. which is why. Deeper water loses oxygen a lot. Deeper water loses oxygen in that way because oxygen cannot supply from the upper part. Is that what you are writing here, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Matsuda Sese already, uh, what is it? Uh, give some clarification again too. So group three, please. Do you have some question? No, sir. No? <laughs> yeah. And then group one. For now, no, sir. Enough. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sese, do you have some comment or maybe question? Hello. Uh, no. uh, for group two. I think so. Uh, maybe I will give it to Tosese. Maybe we are going to. Okay. So, if no question or comment, uh, let's close today's uh, lecture. So, uh, please say uh, thank you to Matsuda Sensei. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Matsuda Sensei. Yeah, thank you, Matsuda Sensei. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, can you? You open your camera for today. Okay, please open your camera. Uh, Bibin Sensei, take a picture. Ginky. So, okay. Just for a moment. Yeah. Okay. Norma, Azara, Desak, Madip. Okay, thank you. Rirok, Ririko, Kodera. Norma, can you open? And uh, Desak? Yes. Okay. Norma, okay. And then Desak. Okay. Thank you very much. So, I think uh, today just... Uh, one, one, one person is open. Oh, you stick up. Pak paham, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to say, I think uh, finish. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, we will, uh, so, in Japan, we will enter into a long vacation. Uh, it's called Obon. So, the next lecture will be held on... 19. Uh, 19. Yes. So, please come back 19 and uh, please uh, stay healthy. Okay. Uh, let's close today's lecture. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sampai jumpa lagi. あ、<笑> <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. So bye bye. So okay, you can... thank you. Okay, maybe I will close by myself here directly. Okay, I will click the end. Thank you very much.